Chapter one, Letter of Blood. That seems very unsanitary. <laughs> we open in a disco club. We're in Camarocho during the early 1980s. Damn, that was... The 1980s? Yeah, back when Japan's economy was good, sort of. Wow. With our focus being on a man in a trench coat who exits the club through the back door, approaches a nearby building via the back alley, and then brandishes his gun before entering the building. You know someone's a badass when they exit through the back door? With a gun, of all things. Yes. <laughs> you can't forget the trench coat. Oh yeah, you can't forget the trench coat. He slowly walks down the hall, being prepared to shoot anyone he sees, before hearing a gunshot and hiding around a corner. From peeking out, he's able to see a man in black clothing being gunned down by Shintaro Kazama. Before collapsing, the man in black makes a vow in Korean that even if he dies, we'll live on. Interesting. So it's like, cut off the head and two more will take its place. Something like that, yeah. Once Kazama leaves, the man in the trench coat comes out to check on the man in black, who is able to ask that he save his child before finally dying. That feels very out of nowhere, just asking someone to take care of your kid that you've just seen. Well, I mean, like, if you're dying and you just see someone run up to help you, you're just like, do you mind helping my child? Because, like, you don't really have much options. The man in the trench coat rushes to save the child, the building now on fire. Of course it is. Opening room after room before finding a woman cradling her young child. The man proclaims to stay calm, saying he's not with Kazama and wants to help get her and the kid out. Though the woman, once again speaking in Korean, tells him to back off, proclaiming she won't let anyone take her baby, before attempting to jump out the window saying she wants to die. Holy shit. That's edgy. <laughs> the man rebutting that the kid is innocent and doesn't deserve death. This convincing her to hand over her child before falling to the ground. Do we even know who this person is? Not yet, no. We've not been given a name. We cut to the same man, who looks much older and is sitting in a room surrounded with speakers and music players. He looks through the empty chamber of his gun before proclaiming that it's been over 20 years since the incident we saw. Oh my god, flashback, whoa. We cut over to Stardust, where we see Yuya having to protect the club from a bunch of Chinese gang members. Hey, Yuya, he's back! Yes! Oh my god, cameo. <laughs> With him stating the town has been going downhill, another host asking if he thinks something like what happened last year could be going on. Yuya hoping it's not, but wishing Kiryu was still around. We then shift over to the Millennium Tower, which now houses the new Kazama family office, the group now being led by Osumu Kashiwagi. A Kazama family man enters the office to report what happened at Stardust, Kashiwagi asking if they were from Kansai before being told they were Chinese Mafia, with Kashiwagi then saying not to escalate the situation as he's worried about potentially sparking a war. It being revealed there's concerns of a Kansai invasion due to the Omi Alliance likely being upset that their chief of HQ, Yukio Tarada, switched sides to become the Tojo's fifth chairman. After he sends the man out to tell the rest of the family to back off, he looks out the window before questioning if what he's doing is the right move, asking what Kiryu would do in his situation. Oh, that's so dramatic. He looks out the window. Yeah, he's having a smoke as well, so just to add to it. He has a fedora that covers his eyes. <laughs> okay, it's not going that far. <laughs> <laughs> we then transition to a few floors down, where a man in a camo jacket is talking over the phone saying that we've been waiting over 20 years, with the guy on the other end stating he doesn't care for the history lesson and to send in the fireworks. The camo jacket man saying that this is for all the comrades they killed and that this will be their revenge, the man on the phone making it clear that he's not one of their comrades, with the two just sharing a similar goal of making Camarocho a sea of fire, and once the job's over, they will be strangers again. Why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? The man in the camo jacket tells him to just enjoy the show, and after hanging up, claims that a sea of fire won't be enough to put the souls of those who died to rest. Whoa. That has to be the edgiest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Yeah. 
We shift over to Kiryu, who awakens from having PTSD nightmares over the events of the previous year. Fair enough. Haruka comes in to check Kiryu's okay, her holding flowers they plan to take on a visit that day, her then leaving the flowers with Kiryu before heading out to make breakfast. We then see them at a graveyard, paying respect to those who died the previous year by visiting the graves of Kazama, Yumi, and Nishiki. I like if you're gonna visit the graves of people who died last year. You'd probably have to make a day of it, <laughs> because there's so many of them. Whilst they tell their fallen loved ones about how they've changed since their passings, the two are approached by Tarada, who has something he can only tell the previous chairman. Though Kiri requests he not refer to him that way, due to having left the criminal life behind to raise Haruka. I'm assuming that won't last very long. Hmm. I don't know. Tarada tells Kiryu he's planning to call a truce with the Omi Alliance's fifth chairman, Jin Goda, claiming he can't think of another way to prevent a Tojo Omi war, as the Tojo is still in shambles after the events of last year, with a war being an almost guaranteed win for the Omi. Sing Kumbaya on a campfire. <laughs> Don't cause war, please. Don't kill us. Yay. Kiryu states that given how powerful Jin Goda is, he's doubtful that he'd agree to a truce. But when he makes his leave, Torada begs Kiryu for some advice, Kiryu not wanting to help due to being an honest man. Gunshots ring out as Omi Alliance men have killed Torada's security at the graveyard's entrance and shot Torada in the arm, stating they're here to assassinate him, with Kiryu stepping up to defend Torada as the Tojo can't afford to lose their chairman. It's up to 11, like, just like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I always say. It's like whenever we need to interrupt the plot, we'll just have random gunshots. Mm. That's it. That happens all the time. The last one. <laughs> After defeating them, Kiryu turns to check on Tarada, only for an Omi man to run out, with Kiryu jumping to grab one of the defeated goon's guns, then both firing, Kiryu hearing the Omi man, however Tarada jumps in the way of the bullet meant for Kiryu. Oh no. Oh. Kiryu checks on Tarada, whose hands Kiryu a letter telling him to take it to Jin Goda, saying Kiryu was a bigger man than him before collapsing, with him then dying during the ambulance ride to the hospital, the paramedics saying he likely died from blood loss. God damn it. Oh. Oh. Fuck's sake. We're not even like halfway through chapter one and already we've had the first death with Tarada. Yeah. There's a character from a previous game as well. It's just. Whilst Kiryu looks at the letter, Haruka says she'll stay at Sunflower Orphanage due to his important mission. Well, that's depressing. The, the grave numbers are just going to be increasing tenfold. Kiryu brings the letter back to Tojo HQ. The room being filled with several patriarchs and the clan's acting chairman, Yaoyoi Dojima, the widow of Sohei Dojima, who reads the letter aloud to the men in the room. The men start getting into arguments on whether or not it's a good idea to follow Tarada's wishes, some not wanting to be allies with the group that just murdered their boss, whilst others recognize the Tojo isn't in a position to go to war. Yaoyoi demands silence before questioning why Kiryu is is going to Kansai to make the truce proposition, Kiryu stating he's doing it to fulfill Tarada's last request, and that he's fully willing to risk the danger that comes with entering enemy territory, Yaoyoi then asking if he's still hung up on the murder of Dojima, reminding him it's been 11 years since then and everyone is now aware that Nishiki was the murderer. Especially considering so many more people have died since then. However, Kiryu claims that due to him and Nishiki having been blood brothers, that any debts Nishiki left are his to pay. She allows Kiryu to head out, and when given some rebuttal by the Tojo Patriarchs, she brings out a katana and tells anyone who has a problem with Kiryu doing this to step forward, reminding them a botched talk will result in an East vs West war. The fact that I'm hardly shocked that someone brings in a katana is quite telling. Yeah. Yeah, I feel they, like. <laughs> they, they finally bring out something that's not a gun. Yeah. I know! Wow, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, man. <laughs> 
we've got more diversity in weapons. Before Kiryu leaves, he has one request, saying there's one person he needs to see before he heads to Kansai, Dojima's son, Daigo Dojima, believing he could be the person to help rebuild the clan as its sixth chairman. Yaoyoi informs Kiryu that since he went to jail, Daigo has changed as a person, revealing that when Kiri was arrested, with it being believed he was the one who killed Sohei Dojima, Daigo ended up trying to make his own move on the Omi and ended up getting arrested five years ago, with him nowadays just wasting his time partying and getting drunk around Kamurocho. Kiryu heads back to Kamurocho to find Daigo, following a trail of chaos around the city before eventually finding him in the cabaret club Shine. Kiryu tells Daigo they need to talk, though his group immediately try to get Kiryu to back off, eventually coercing him into a fight outside. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> After defeating them, Daigo comes out and tells the group to go back inside as Kiryu's out of their league. Daigo telling Kiryu that they're just a bunch of punks that started following him around and calling him boss. When Daigo tries to leave, Kiryu asks him to come back to the Tojo. Kiryu saying Daigo owes how far he's gotten to the clan and his father. Daigo telling Kiryu that when he was younger, Kiryu was his personal hero and the only person he trusted. But that isn't the case anymore. And now that the clan has gone to shit since his father died, the Tojo isn't worth saving. Damn. Kiryu tells Daigo he's right, that the clan isn't worth saving right now but he believes that Daigo could make it something worth saving. My question is for how long, because it's like, these kind of things happen, like, what, every year at this point? Like, it's just like something ridiculous happens every year. Daigo brings up how Kiryu was the one who effectively put the clan on its last legs the previous year. Kiryu's saying that he's back to take responsibility before punching Daigo in the face, asking if that woke him up yet. Wow, okay. Why is Daigo blaming Kiryu for this when the entire thing, the, the entire thing was Nishiki's fault? Yeah, fucking Nishiki, we need to hold him accountable like, even though he's dead. Daigo points out how Kiryu hasn't changed, his only method of fixing things being to punch them, before claiming he's the same, leading to a fight. <laughs> After the fight, Kiryu shows Daigo the letter from Tarada, and tells him his plan to go to Kansai the next day, him wanting Daigo to protect the Tojo if he doesn't come back alive. Daigo states he's coming with Kiryu, saying he's got a score to settle due to the Omi being responsible for him to going to jail five years ago, which was the event that led to Daigo's current downfall adding he's going regardless of if Kiryu is or not, with Daigo taking his leave as he promises he'll meet Kiryu at the train station. Like if Daigo's gonna keep throwing shade at Kiryu for something that Nishiki was the one to do, it's a, it's a bit confusing, like a little bit. Basically, if if Kerry and Nishiki didn't fight over Yumi, Tojo probably wouldn't be in as much shit as it was now. Plus, you have to add in the fact that the inciting incident that led to Yakuza 1 happening was Kerry taking the fall for Nishiki's murder. Like, if he didn't do that, it's arguable Yakuza 1 wouldn't have even happened. Yeah, oh, yeah that's, that's fair. True. Also, we need to have Fs in the chat for Torada. So how does it feel knowing that characters from previous games can get killed off now? It's um, um... a mildly horrifying revelation. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's like, it's disappointing, but not surprising, because it's like, well, I'd like to see more from them. But then again, it's, this series is, it doesn't really pull its punches, does it? So it's like, you know what? Kill them all! Kill them all! <laughs> Just based on what you know of them now, how do you feel about the two new characters, Yaoyoi and Daigo? Yaoyoi, she she seems kind of badass. Like she she doesn't take shit from. She pulled out a katana. Mm. So, True. 
that definitely gives a first impression, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, Daigo, I think, like, he he kind of comes off as edgy, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what if Shadow the Hedgehog was in Yakuza? <laughs> yeah, he's the shadow to carry Uz Sonic. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. God. I regret this. I regret <laughs> this comparison. <laughs> Chapter 2, The Dragon of Kansai. The dragon and it's not Kirio? What is this sorcery? We open on the train ride to Osaka, Kirio coming back from buying some drinks for him and Daigo, before asking him why he challenged the army five years ago. Daigo claiming he was challenged by Ryuji Goda, the second patriarch of the Omi's Go Ryu clan and the son of the Omi chairman. Specifically, the Go Ryu clan were making regular visits to Kamurocho five years ago, picking fights with any member of the Tojo, the plan being to try and lure them into coming to Kansai. Daigo taking the bait, expecting a one-on-one -on -one fight with Ryuji, only to be immediately met by police, with him being sent to jail for five years as he was carrying a firearm, with Daigo feeling he can't lead the Tojo until he settled his beef with Ryuji, him giving Kiryu the advice to watch his back, as there's no telling what the Omi could do. I thought that's a very different sentencing when it comes to carrying a gun. I feel like in America you get a handshake and just like carry on with your day. <laughs> Japan are like the UK where it's illegal to own firearms. Surprising considering how many firearms are pulled and used in this series. So. Yeah. We then see Kiryu and Daigo arriving in the town, Sotenbori. Daigo deciding to go straight to the hotel due to his bad memories from the last time he came here, with Kiryu deciding to hit the town. Where after some shenanigans, he manages to get a VIP seat at the Cabaret Grand. He must feel so special. Whilst Kiryu sat down, he overhears some men further down, shouting about wanting more girls at their table. However, the hostess utters Kiryu to not stare at them, as they're big Yakuza within the area. It seems like you throw a rock, you hit someone from the Yakuza. Anyone in this group is a member of the Yakuza. Once the manager arrives, they start chewing the guy out for not giving them enough hostesses though they're told to back off by their boss. The hostess compliments the boss, with one of his henchmen telling her that the boss is the future chairman of the Omi Alliance and the Dragon of Kansai. Oh my god, the titular person. Yeah. However, the mood immediately sours, the man having clearly said something wrong, though he's confused as to what with the boss requesting the hostesses leave them for now. The other goons try to tell him what he did wrong, claiming he said the one thing the boss doesn't want to hear. The guy starts apologising, though it's clear he still hasn't figured out what he said wrong. The boss ushers him to sit up and starts emptying a bottle into the guy's glass, telling him to drink the overfilled glass before he smashes the bottle over the guy's head, asking if it's jogged his memory yet. Probably not, because that's not how many memory works, you can't just yeah. <laughs> hit someone with a glass bowl. Kiryu then points out the problem, the fact he called the boss the Dragon of Kansai. Kiryu having gone pretty fed up with the group's constant shouting ruining his evening. Wait, what's wrong with being called a dragon? That sounds pretty cool. We'll get to that. The group get up to take out Kiryu due to him listening in on their conversation, with one of them smashing a bottle over Kiryu's head, with Kiryu not reacting at all before proceeding to throw the guy over a ledge and onto the club's piano. Holy shit. This then leading to a fight. <laughs> After Kiryu takes them down, he gets applause from the group's boss, impressed with Kiryu's fighting prowess. He apologises for his men's actions and requests that Kiryu have a drink with him, with Kiryu initially feigning interest before finding out the boss is actually Ryuji Goda, the second patriarch of the Go Ryu clan and the man who got Daigo arrested. It's a small world. Ryuji praises Kiryu, claiming that if there was a guy like him in Kansai, he would have heard of him by now with him then asking for Kiryu's name, claiming that since he's buying the most expensive drink and disclosed his identity, the least Kiryu could do in return is tell him his name. 
Kiryu does so, but when Ryuji shows visible anger at the chance he's talking to the Tojo's Kazuma Kiryu, he lies and says he doesn't know who Ryuji's talking about. Ryuji laughs it off, before claiming he couldn't be the real Kiryu anyway, as he wouldn't be sat here having drinks, but instead he'd have his hands full preparing for war with Ryuji explaining why he got so mad. He explains that he hates the nickname the Dragon of Kansai. Specifically, he doesn't have an issue with the dragon part, but he gets enraged by the of Kansai, claiming the world is only big enough for one dragon. I had a feeling that one-liner would come out at some point. <laughs> and after perceiving that Kiryu agrees with him, tells him that at midnight, the biggest fireworks are going to go off in Kamurocho. Ryuji claiming he set it up to usher in the party of a lifetime, as the fireworks are the opening ceremony to the next day, when the dragon of Dojima dies. Ryuji takes his leave, telling Kiryu one last thing, saying that he should wear some cologne, as Ryuji could smell the stench of blood off of Kiryu from a mile away. <laughs> I thought you were going to say because you stink like shit. <laughs> <laughs> After Kiryu leaves, he spots a crowd gathering around a large TV, reporting news that a bomb has gone off at the top floors of the Millennium Tower, it reporting they came from the offices of a family organization, that being the Kazama family. Of course a bomb goes off. We cut over to paramedics and firefighters working to help out during the aftermath, with a member in the crowd watching the situation being the man from the opening, claiming it has begun. We move over to Kamuro Police Station, where Sudo is on the phone to a Chief Kurahashi. He confirms that no link has been found to Kansai yet, but the two share a suspicion that foreign gangs are somehow involved, with them agreeing to sort arrangements. Sudo stating the only one capable of doing what they plan is Date. Hi. I'd say that one was mainly just a chapter to introduce Ryuji. I, I, I'm guessing that he's probably like one of the major villains in this game. Yeah, uh, what are your first impressions of the guy? He... Comes off as quite arrogant. Mm, I agree with that. This is solely based off his hair. <laughs> uh, is, are you profiling him because he's blonde? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> also, Millennium Tower bombing. <laughs> with its. Oh yeah. <laughs> We're only on chapter two, and the tower's been bombed again. Jesus. Like. Wait. I... Oh yeah, I... it did get bombed in the first one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like. I wish I could say I was surprised, but I can't because it, yeah. it's just so on brand. Mm. Mm -hmm. Chapter 3, The Yakuza Huntress. <gasps> that sounds cool. <laughs> Excuse me, I just ch choked mid-sentence. That sounds cool, is what I tried to say. Okay. <laughs> God, I'm dying. That's fine. Kiryu and Daigo meet up the next morning, the two discussing what happened last night, with them suggesting they should call Yaoyoi to make sure Kashiwagi is okay. We then cut to elsewhere in Osaka, where we see a woman dealing with some Yakuza, this being Kaoru Sayama, a female detective from Osaka's organized crime division, whose reputation has earned her the nickname the Yakuza Huntress, with us seeing her bust a family patriarch for extortion, assault, tax evasion, and when he tries to fight back, resisting arrest. We then see a phone call come in for the Osaka's police chief of organized crime, Sutomo Besho. News of the Tojo Omi Treaty having reached the force, the Tokyo PD requesting they send in someone to bring Kiryu into custody, since if the meeting goes awry and Kiryu gets killed, it'll mean an all-out Yakuza war. 
I have a feeling we'll probably be fine. He deals with most situations by throwing people off ledges, so, you know. Sayama immediately takes interest in the job, after initially overhearing the phone call, and then finding out it's to protect the former Tojo chairman. Besho turns her down, claiming she's not the babysitting type, though she ends up persisting, saying it could be a chance to show Kanto what the Osakan police can do. Besho then asks if she's only doing it because she's still hung up about the Tojo, but when Sayama insists it's for a duty he has a sock in police, he lets her take the job. Now that we've like introduced ourselves to like the like police characters, I'm waiting for like the stereotypes of like, he's a renegade, he's troubled, he plays <laughs> by his own rules. <laughs> <laughs> You're a loose cannon. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Coming back to Kiryu, he and Daigo have reached the Omi Alliance HQ. Before entering, Daigo confirms that whilst the Kazama officers were calling the explosion, Kashiwagi is fine, with Daigo also having suspicions that the Omi were the ones responsible for bombing the tower. Kiryu saying it was likely Ryuji, telling Daigo about his run-in with the Patriarch the previous night. At that moment, the entrance opens, with the two being greeted by dozens of Omi men, with them heading to the top floor to meet the highest ranking Omi family members. So basically, Kashiwagi is fine, you don't have to worry about him dying. He's too powerful, you need more than a bomb to kill him. What kind of person would be bound by human mortality? That's just insane. Not Kashiwagi. No. He, he's a god among Yakuza. Pretty much. Like, yeah. he's the guy Kiryu looks up to. That's how powerful he is. Good point. That's pretty good scaling. We then see them waiting in the room with various Omi patriarchs, with the chairman, Jin Goda, being brought out in a wheelchair amongst more high-ranking members. After the formal greetings between the two, Jin introduces his officers, starting with Ryo Takashima, their new chief of HQ after Tarada left. Ryo reveals he was Tarada's sworn brother, stating he's upset with the news of Tarada's death. Before Jin can introduce the next officer, Daigo starts getting angry, asking how Ryo can be upset over his death when he was killed by Omi men. Ryo revealing that the hit was carried against the will of the Omi. Oh yeah, sure it was. Sure, we'll just believe you. When Daigo starts barking back, he's demanded to shut up by Taranosuke Sengoku, the patriarch of the Omi's Sengoku family, him claiming that the meeting is for people of status and that a punk like Daigo should stay quiet. Though Sengoku is quickly told to be quiet and not to be rude to their guests by Ryo, Kiryu apologizes for them starting it. Jin starts apologizing for what happened to Tarada, only for Sengoku to interrupt, saying they shouldn't feel bad for what their organization did to a traitor. By this point, Daigo's had enough and claims none of the people there care about what happened to Tarada, bringing up the Omi's planned deal with Jingu the previous year to take over the Tojo behind Tarada's back. Our uh, poor Tarada is getting his name like dragged around and he's not even alive to defend himself. <laughs> Jinren reveals that the deal wasn't done by him or his officers, going silent when Daigo says to stop passing off blame, Ryo then coming in to explain as the topic is sensitive to the chairman, revealing the Jingu incident was an independent act made by the Goryu clan and Jin Goda's son, Ryuji Goda, him seemingly having not taken on Jin's temperance and basically just doing whatever he wants due to his position within the Omi with them believing Ryuji is likely the person responsible for Tarada's assassination as well. So basically, Ryuji is a spoilt shit who basically uses his position in the Omi to get away with whatever the fuck he wants. That just screams 1%. I'm just gonna say. Sengoku then leaves, losing interest in the meeting, though not before flexing his wealth by saying if the Tojo needs incense for Tarada's funeral, he's willing to lend a billion or two. This guy definitely wipes his ass with $50 bills. Definitely. Mm. Jin then laments that the Omi is in disarray, as the organization has gone far too big to properly manage and keep in line, the Omi consisting of 120 groups with 35,000 men, saying that whilst people like Ryo and Tarada have been able to stay sharp, some of the young blood like Ryuji and Sengoku are simply out of control, adding that losing Tarada was a big blow to both the Tojo and the Omi, 
him wanting to keep the power balance and avoid war between the East and West, saying he wants to see Kiryu rebuild the Tojo, being more than happy to offer the Omi's assistance. Kiryu then hands over the letter from Tirada, revealing his own plan for a truce between the two, proposing a 50-50 truce between the two organizations. Jin agrees to the deal. Kiryu says he'll invite Yaoyoi to the Omi HQ as soon as possible. However, Jin says it's the Omi's turn to make the trip, claiming he'll come to Tojo HQ. So yeah, overall, Jin Goat is actually a pretty decent guy. <laughs> Yeah, I he, he kind of like, I thought he was going to be evil, but no, he's, he's a good guy. I feel like it's just like natural to just assume everyone's evil. I mean, fair. However, the building is soon stormed by the Go Ryu clan, Ryuji amongst them, him not wanting to participate in the truce with the Tojo. Daigo attempts to step in to finish his business with Ryuji, Though, not only does he show no interest in return, not even recognising Daigo, but proceeds to knock him down with one gut punch. Ryuji then reveals he's staging a coup against the Omi, as a truce with the Tojo would ruin his plans, with the Omi officers and Jin Goda being ushered out of the room with guns. He reveals he actively wants to start a war between the two organizations, along with killing Kiryu, and then ordering his men to take down Kiryu to see if he's worth his time. As uh, spoilers, he probably is. <laughs> <laughs> Kiryu manages to fight them off, Ryuji being glad Kiryu lives up to his legend status. But before he can start fighting him, Ryuji gets punched in the face and knocked down by Daigo, him still wanting to sell his score with Ryuji, telling Kiryu to go save Jin Goda while he fights Ryuji. Kiryu proceeding to run through the Omi HQ, fighting off the Go Ryu clan the whole way. So Daigo fights one guy, and then Kiryu fights like dozens upon fights. dozens. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's Yakuza, like, you can't have Kiryu in a one-on-one -on -one fight, he has to be fighting 50 men at all times. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> ah, yes. A fair fight. A battle will be <laughs> legendary! <laughs> He finally reaches Jin in the front courtyard, who is ashamed of his son's actions and is incredibly apologetic, Kiryu saying it's fine. Just then, Daigo stumbles in and collapses from his fight against Ryuji. Kiryu then demands Daigo to escape and take Jin to Tojo HQ, saying that getting the truce signed between both parties is their main goal right now, and that he can't afford to lose Daigo. He then agrees after some initial pushback, this then leading to a fight between the two dragons. <laughs> Kiryu ultimately wins, though he's unsatisfied, claiming he only won because Ryuji was already worn out from his fight against Daigo. Ryuji gets up, saying this won't be over until one of them is dead, but suddenly police sirens are heard from outside, Ryuji running off whilst making sure Kiryu knows he's not done with him yet. The police arrive with Sayama making the order to arrest everyone inside the building, with her then approaching Kiryu and arresting him for assault. That, that's kind of a long time coming, if anything. A lot mm. of fights we've yeah. <laughs> like, seen. Uh, 
this chapter was interesting. It feels like the puzzle pieces have sort of been thrown out, and now, like, throughout the rest of the story, we're gonna see how they fall into place. Because this is basically around the same time the main mystery of Yakuza 1 was starting. How do you feel the story of 2 compares to 1 so far? I think we we're experiencing a little bit more build up compared to the first one. Yeah, like 2 seems to be taking its time a bit. I like one where it's where it just drops by chapter 3 they've already gone bam Nishiki's evil, bam the chairman's dead, bam the 10 billion's gone, bam someone shot Kazama. Yeah. To be fair there's a lot more action in 2 than there is in 1 because I remember like what we had our first bomb in like the finale now we get one in the f like immediately the end of chapter two it's like oh okay so it seems like we're just throwing it's just balls to the wall insanity for a while i see would you say yakuza 2 has a better start than one i don't think action necessarily means better i think it can also like i think you need some build up at least a bit beforehand but i guess it makes sense if it's a sequel because for the most part you probably will understand most of what's happening so it's like you may as well just like throw him in immediately and be like this is what's happening and everyone's gonna die and there goes Torado he's dead and oh my god we really mean business now we're killing off characters that were in the last one and we're pulling no punches etc and so yeah okay no, I think it's quite I think the, the build up for the first one is better but I understand why the second one is not as good because it's not really supposed to be chapter four the four kings of Omi we open with Date at the police HQ, and it turns out he's become a legend on the force due to his involvement in the previous game, with him quitting the job not too long after. He ends up running into the guy we saw in the opening, who we learn is named Jiro Kawara, though Date refers to him as Killer Kawara. Is it because he kills? Uh, maybe. Kawara tells Date that since they last met, he's been moved to work in foreign affairs, Date viewing it as a sick joke given how many people he's killed on the job. Kawara says that what happened was years ago, Date saying he still remembers what he did like it was yesterday. Despite Date feeling they'll never cross paths again, Kawara tells him that he's here because he's on the same job as Date. So I think we're getting a good setup of what their dynamic is. <laughs> I was like, good cop, bad cop. Well, it's more so, Date is wholesome guy, Kawara has murdered people on the job. He seems like too much of an anarchist to be on the police force. <laughs> the two head to the planned meeting room, third floor basement, archive room 13, an often forbidden room nicknamed the Scandal Graveyard. Wow, that's an intense name. Basically, it's where they put all the files for cases that if they got revealed to the public would get the police in hot water. Why keep them then? I think it's a case of they legally have to. Inside, they meet Sudo alongside Watari Haru Kurahashi, the police chief of foreign affairs. Date questions the joint meeting between organized crime and foreign affairs. Sudo explains that whilst they were monitoring the Omi alliance after Tarada's murder, they've started to suspect a foreign group was involved likely the Chinese or Korean Mafia. Kawara then adding that his division have been watching Asian Mafia activity for the last year, with there having been some big moves recently, then expecting something big to go down. Suno reveals he's been monitoring Kamarojo for weeks under secret orders from Kurahashi, and not too long after, the Millennium Tower was bombed effectively confirming their suspicions. So this is the world building that we've been waiting for. When Date asks why organized crime are getting involved, Sudo says that by picking up phone calls, they found out the bombers were working with Ryuji Goda, connecting them to the Omi, with organized crime and foreign affairs working together to try and figure out who the bomber is, so they can figure out the organization they work for. Though unfortunately, despite getting the recording, they can't figure out where exactly the bomber was during the call. Date then asks what the special mission was that apparently only he could do, Kurahashi then revealing a picture of Kazuki, the owner of Stardust, revealing that Ryuji had come to Kamurocho six months ago to have a meeting with him. Again, you do have to assume that everyone you know has some sort of 
alternative affiliation. In addition, they found out that Kazuki is just a pseudoname, his real name being Jinwoo Khan, heavily suggesting he's Korean, with Sudo and Kurahashi wanting Date to meet Kazuki to try and figure out if he's actually part of the Korean Mafia, then believing he trusts Date after last year's events. Fascinating. It's very... Hmm. I'm trying to like... It's very... It's a bit more complex this time. Yeah, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. It's like, it, does that link back to what happened in the first one? Like, has it been acting out of character? But I don't know. Cut back to Sayama, who's driving a car with Kiryu in handcuffs, him asking where they're going. Sayama then pulls over and takes off Kiryu's cuffs, explaining the assault charge was just a cover to take him into private custody, adding that if Kiryu tries to run off, she'll arrest him for real. Kiryu looks up and spots a guy at the top of a building. It's a sniper aimed right at them. Kiryu instinctively covers Sayama with the car, getting shot at twice. When he looks back, the sniper's gone, but there's more pressing matters as one of the bullets hits Sayama in the shoulder. Oh, okay. Thank God. Like, if it's if it's non-lethal, then it should be okay. <laughs> he notices the bullet is still in there and asks where the nearest hospital is. Sayama instead tells him to go to a bar in Sotenbori named Aoi before passing out. Need the beer. Kiryu runs around town to find the place, though when he gets there, the bar's owner, Tamio, tries to kick him out thinking he's another thug looking for protection money. However, when he tells her that Sayama is injured in the car, she demands Kiryu bring her to the bar as fast as possible. After Kiryu runs back to get Sayama and then brings her to the bar, he's instructed to lie her down with Kiryu leaving as there's not much else he can do. Whilst outside, Kiryu gets a call from Daigo, saying he managed to get out with Jin Goda, the two now being in a car heading for Kamurocho. Kiryu trusting Daigo to handle the truce meetings from now on. A while later, he gets a call from Tamio, who tells him that Sayama is fine and currently asleep after taking some medication, with her asking Kiryu to come back with some bandages. Once Kiryu gets there, he sits down and has a chat with Tamio, finding out she managed to help Sayama due to her previous work in a hospital. With Kiryu's comment that the two seem close, leading her to reveal she's Sayama's adoptive mother. I feel like most of the Yakuza cast are just adopted at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Saying she took her in as her parents died not too long after she was born. Kiryu feeling that would explain why Sayama's response to getting shot was to tell him to go to a bar, as the first response would usually be to ask for their parents. Kiryu knowing this due to his own history as an orphan. Sayama interrupts the chat, and when Kiryu asks if she's okay, she tells Kiryu he's got no reason to worry about her, and when Tamiyo questions why she's being so cold to the person who carried her to safety, she claims she won't go as far as to thank her Yakuza. Ah, so she has a personal vendetta against the Yakuza. Interesting. Kiryu is just happy that Sayama's seemingly fine, but is confused how Ryuji managed to put out a hit that fast, Sayama rebutting that it couldn't have been the Goryu clan, as it doesn't follow how they usually operate, with them typically using a more straightforward and direct approach than hiring a professional sniper. Her knowing it was a professional given the shot distance and the fact that the bullet is smaller than the average rifle round suggesting the possibility they weren't intending to kill, though what they actually wanted to do is unknown, her claiming that the only way to know would be to ask the guy who shot her. It's very rare to see people shoot not to kill. Kiryu then gets up, planning to basically do exactly that and find out who shot her, as he doesn't even know who he's supposed to be fighting. Sayama suggesting he take the bullet to an information dealer at a mahjong parlor, with her adding that if Kiryu tries to skip town, she'll send the cops after him to put him in jail. After a bit of a run around to get an invite to the mahjong parlor, he meets the info broker named Isaki and pays him 100,000 yen for info on the bullet. He tells Kiryu the bullet is one used by the Takashima family, him being able to tell, as the bullets are a special kind used by the guns smuggled in from the mainland, but Takashima being the only guy in Kansai who imports them, with the venture of reselling them being too risky a move for him to take, as it could lead to a trail back to him. Kiryu questions that if this is common knowledge, why don't the police do anything? However, Asaki won't answer without further payment, 
They even carried a question why Takashima would do that. Yeah, because I was going to say, it was like, if he fears having a trail back to him, he was immediately found. We shift over to Takashima, sat in an interrogation room on the phone. The person on the end confirming he only dealt a non-fatal wound and used the bullet like Takashima asked, revealing he wanted Kiryu to find out he did it in order to send the message that he can't trust anyone. Him ending the call with the message to leave Kiryu for now, with Besho then entering to start the interrogation. I feel that the messages are a bit too cryptic. Takashima claims the Omi are the victims and that Kiryu should be arrested, mentioning how he should be brought in by Sayama, though he refuses to answer when asked how he knows about her. He then asks Besho if he's her from his superintendent. Besho saying he was told to let Takashima go, though as he leaves, Besho threatens that if he starts working with the Goryu clan, he'll go after him. Takashima replying that his police versus Yakuza mentality is outdated. Back to Kiryu, he wants more information about Takashima. After either paying another 300 grand, or by finding some information in exchange, Asaki tells Kiryu that Takashima is a university graduate with loads of political connections with his fast rise to power in the Omi mainly being thanks to his loyalty to Jin Goda. Just then, he gets a phone call, with Kiryu taking his leave thanking him for the info. However, he stopped with the dealer now knowing his name, as Kiryu's had a 100 million yen bounty put on him, with everyone in the parlor getting up to take him down. And now it's another Kiryu fights 50 guys episode. <laughs> I'm surprised, I feel like, considering how it's always been like that, I'm surprised it wasn't, like, always, there wasn't always a bounty on him, because that's what it kind of feels like. After defeating them, Kiryu continues beating Asaki until he tells him who put out the hit, revealing it to be the work of the Sengoku family, effectively meaning that Kiryu now has three high-ranking Omi men after him, as apparently whoever takes out Kiryu first will become the next Omi chairman. It's almost flattering how many people are just obsessed with Kiryu at this point. Cut to the Sengoku family office, where one of Sengoku's men is getting a phone call about Kiryu's fight in the Mahjong Park. Sengoku deciding to leave Kiryu for the time being, as he believes Ryuji and the Goryu clan are too incompetent to take out Kiryu. He believes that the moment Kiryu heads to Kamurocho, Ryuji will immediately start tailing him, so he's taking the precaution of having his men send over 1 billion yen to spread it over Kamurocho. Kiryu heads back to Aoiwe, overhears Sayama and Tamiyo fighting outside, him learning that Tamiyo refused uses to tell her about who her parents are, with Sayama wanting to use Kiryu to find out the truth of who they were, as she believes they're somehow connected to the Tojo clan. Kiryu enters pretending to not have heard their conversation, asking if Sayama's arm is better. She then gets a phone call, with the person first checking if she's okay, before asking to speak with Kiryu. This turning out to be Besho, who tells Kiryu that Daigo and Jin Goda have been kidnapped by a gang that was speaking a foreign language, with him suggesting Kiryu should head down to Kamurocho as their getaway car license plates had Kamurocho numbers, though he can't give any more details due to police protocol. Kiryu announces his plan to leave for Kamurocho, with Sayama insisting she come along. I think hmm. now the plot is like properly starting to pick up. How do you feel about the revelations of basically it's not just Ryuji after Kiryu and also Sayama's family might be connected to the Tojo? <laughs> It's a bit wild that Simon's family might be connected to the Chojo, but it feels pretty on brand that everyone's after Kiryu. <laughs> this dude cannot yeah, like, exactly. break. No. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Bear in mind, he's only doing this because he felt he owed a favor to Tarada and the Tojo. 
and then they repay him by everyone wanting to kill him. That seems yeah. on brand. Kiri <laughs> uh, is like the most unlucky man in existence. He's too powerful, so the world had to balance out by not allowing him to be happy. Yeah, he's unlucky that everyone hates him for some reason, but lucky enough that he's just ungodly strong enough to just repel anyone who comes anywhere near him. So it's like, there's a good and the bad, you know? For every down, there's an up. Chapter 5, Hidden Past. Oh, is it a flashback? I don't think so. Kiryu and Sayama reach Kamurocho, though not too long after she ends up almost falling over, being caught by Kiryu who finds out she still has a fever, and despite some resistance decides to carry Sayama the rest of the way to their destination, the now abandoned Serena, believing it can work as a hideout spot. Not too long after entering, Kiryu gets a phone call from Kashiwagi, calling to check Kiryu is okay after what happened in Osaka, with the two then arranging a meeting with the other Tojo officers about what happened to Daigo and Jin Goda. When Kiryu goes to get a taxi to head to Tojo HQ, she suddenly gets a call from Daigo, though the phone is quickly taken by the unknown kidnapper, them telling Kiryu that if he wants to save Daigo, to meet them alone at 1am tomorrow night at the Amano building. Them saying he'll also learn about what happened to Jin Goda. You know what, we haven't seen Ryuji in a while, how much do you bet he's the kidnapper? I think it's the police dude, Kawara. So we've got one for Ryuji and one for Kawara. Kiryu tells the Tojo Patriarchs everything that went down at the Omi HQ and about the current situation with Daigo and Jin. Yaoyoi points out the kidnapper's meeting with Kiryu is a trap. Him saying he knows, but it's currently their best way of figuring out who they're actually dealing with. Kerry also having suspicions their reasoning for kidnapping the two being due to an allegiance with the Goryu clan. Yaoyoi makes a request that the patriarch Koji Shindo help out as the Amano building is in his territory. However, there's just one problem. Shindo is the new patriarch for the Nishikiyama family. Oh, you've got to fucking kill oh. Him having been the family captain Kerry beat up behind Serena the previous year. And put simply, his family are still upset with Kerry after how hard he beat them last year. <laughs> oh god, here we go again. Kashiwagi points out that only happened because Nishiki was a traitor. Well, I could have told you that, <laughs> to be fair. With Shindo saying he knows that, but most of the family only became Yakuza because of their respect for Nishiki, going as far as to say he's willing to get expulsed from the clan for disobeying orders if it means he doesn't have to protect Kiryu. Kiryu says he's fine with it, as due to having been Nishiki's sworn brother, he gets how Shindo feels, though he does ask if Shindo has any other motivations than his grudge against him, Shindo replying he doesn't before leaving. Is, is there any other reason why you were doing this? It's like, no, it's because I fucking hate you. It's like, oh, okay, Basically. fair enough. Yeah, no, Shindo, just from his face, you can tell he gives off that vibe. Yeah, just like, you mean like, petty bitch, he's that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After the meeting, Yaoyoi gives Kiryu a key for a hidden storage room filled with items that belonged to officers the Tojo lost the previous year. This having been orchestrated by Tarada, with Yaoyoi believing it was done so to keep order, by preventing the remaining officers from dwelling on the clan's past, suggesting Kiryu might find something in there to help guide the clan. Once inside, amongst the items present, Kiryu finds a familiar looking dagger. Who looks at a dagger as like, I think I've seen this before. You'll get it later. When Kiryu heads back, he runs into Yaoyoi and Kashiwagi, who are worried about the Nishikiyama family going independent, as in addition to the men they had previously, they also ended up absorbing the remnants of the Shimano family, effectively making them the biggest family in the Tojo. It's just a big ball of contempt for Kiryu, Basically. Yeah. essentially. Yaoyoi believing that if they split and the Goryu invade, they're doomed. Kiryu then presenting the dagger and suggesting they bring him back, as he's the only person Kiryu can think of who can fight on even footing with the Goryu. Yaoyoi and Kashiwagi both being somewhat hesitant, though he does end up telling Kiryu he'll find 
him in purgatory. Oh yeah, purgatory. I was like, oh, we'll see you in hell. I was like, oh wait, no, purgatory is a natural place. Once Kiryu gets back to Kamurocho, he gets a phone call from Sayama, who chews him out for running off, with Kiryu rebutting she was unconscious. So she lets him off and asks if he can buy her some underwear and beer on the way back. This sounds like a side quest. <laughs> When Kiryu gets back, she's seemingly gone, but then steps out in a towel, having used the shower in the room next door, adding that her fever's gone and her shoulder doesn't hurt as much, though Kiryu reckons she should still be taking it easy. He then confronts Sayama over her only following him to get info on the Tojo, her then asking if he knew, why did he let her tag along? Kiryu admitting he's a little curious about the Tojo's supposed involvement as well. Sayama explains that, like Tamiyo said, she grew up without knowing her parents. However, she always suspected there was more to her parents' death than what Tamiyo said of them dying shortly after she was born. And then one day, about 10 years ago, she overheard Tamiyo shout over the phone, the Tojo clan's what made Kaoru's life a living hell. With Tamiyo refusing to explain whenever Sayama asked her about it, instead replying, knowing won't make you any happier. It seems like most of this is just like people keeping information from each other. Sayama reveals that since she didn't want to keep hounding her, she joined the police to find out for herself what happened, currently believing the Tojo clan killed her parents, with her sticking with Kiryu to see if that's true. Kiryu says he can sympathise due to his own history with a secret past, mentioning how when he learnt the truth, it brought him nothing but pain, wishing he'd never found out the truth in the first place suggesting some secrets are worth staying hidden. Kiryu and Sayama then head off to Purgatory together, him showing her the entrance by the public toilets. However, when they get there, instead of seeing a park overtaken by homeless people, they instead find a construction site. Uh... After wandering for a bit, he runs into Gary Buster Holmes, who now seems to be employed by the construction company. Hey, good on Gary. Him telling Kiryu that the boss is waiting for him downstairs. After heading through Purgatory, Kiryu enters the office at the end, demanding they come out before throwing the dagger on the floor. The new boss of Purgatory comes out, being none other than the mad dog himself, Goro Majima. Majima! I was wondering when he'd show up. Telling his beloved Kiryu-chan that he has no idea how lonely he's been since he left the Tojo, before asking about Kiryu's lady friend, who promptly informs him she's police. <laughs> Kiryu asks why Majima is in purgatory, him saying that the florist left, having been subcontracted by the police, with them now having access to his camera feed, with him being based on the 50th floor of the Millennium Tower. His departure then leading to Purgatory dying, with Majima then taking over by starting Majima Construction and beginning work on a shopping mall where West Park was called Camarocho Hills. I wonder how many brain cells it took him to come up with that name. <laughs> and that's also uh, the reasoning behind the hard hat. It just looks so ridiculous. Yeah, he wears that the whole game as well. The oh, entire God. game? Yeah, he never takes it off. That's incredible. Kiryu then tells Majima he's here to ask him to come back to the Tojo, Majima being incredibly hesitant, but then agreeing under one condition. Kiryu has to win another tournament in Purgatory's Colosseum, with Kiryu agreeing along with requesting Sayama go back to Serena. During the tournament, Kiryu fights Brazilian juggernaut Robison Shatano de Chuva. Then having a rematch with Gary Buster Holmes, with the final match being against the current champion, Goro Majima. I feel like Maj Majima must have rated it if he's the champion now. My personal headcanon is that the only reason he made Kerry do the tournament is that he just wanted an excuse to fight him again. <laughs> <laughs> Now, 
After Kiryu wins, Majima agrees to talk with Kiryu about rejoining the Tojo. In the office, Kiryu tells Majima he doesn't need him to rejoin, as frankly the Tojo can't handle Majima. They can't handle his sheer masculinity. <laughs> <laughs> they can't handle his masculinity, they can't handle his insanity, and they can't handle his construction equipment. But he requests that Majima just help them out. Majima agrees, though he's still surprised that the Tojo has apparently gotten so bad they're coming to him of all people for help. Kiryu explaining the issues they're having with Shindo and the Goryu clan. Majima comments that something doesn't feel right, saying he thinks something's off about Tarada being assassinated by the Omi, as apparently when Tarada took over the Tojo, they didn't really have any problems with the Omi, saying that if it's just the Goryu family being crazy, it might be legit, but he doesn't think Tarada did anything big enough to warrant getting killed. He also adds that whilst he was in the Tojo, he didn't like Tarada at all, claiming he was always going on about keeping the peace with other clans, making the Tojo look weak. Adding that he believes Tarada kind of screwed over the clan by constantly surrounding himself with yes men, whilst constantly ignoring the old guard like Majima and Kashiwagi. Majima explaining he eventually got fed up with Tarada's shit and quit the clan. So basically, Tarada was maybe not as good as we thought he was. I just had like a personality shift in the year that we didn't see him. No, it's more so Kerry's assessment of Tarada wasn't accurate based on the one interaction they had together. Well, yeah, that, I guess that's fair. Kerry was surprised to find out all this stuff about Tarada, though Majima says not to beat himself up about it. Though he does warn him that whilst it's okay to trust people, you still have to be careful about who you trust. Kiryu heads back to Serena to wait for 1am. When it gets to midnight, Sayama asks Kiryu why he's not heading out yet. He responds by asking if she's scared to find out the truth of her past, with him proceeding to tell her how last year he found out his parents were killed by Kazama when he was a hitman for the Tojo. He says he was able to forgive Kazama as he grew up thinking of him as his father, but asked if she would be able to do the same if she found out the Tojo killed them. Her claiming she doesn't think she'd be able to forgive them, regardless of who actually did it, admitting she's scared of finding out who exactly it was, but that it won't stop her. Kiryu then agrees to let her stay close to find the truth, saying he's fine with it as he's not proud of his Yakuza career, even going as far as saying that if it turns out he was somehow involved, she can kill him no problem as she couldn't forgive whoever did it. She then goes to leave, claiming she's continuing her current job of protecting Kiryu. I'm really glad to see Majima back, but damn, has Purgatory changed. Yeah. It's almost sad to yeah. see. If you're wondering about what happened to all the homeless people, they basically took over one of the abandoned buildings and basically set up their own little casino and gambling hall and called it the uh, the Dragon's Palace. Nice. I'm guessing they don't mention that in the in the main story. No, again, it's a sub story. Main two inputs were both the reveal that the Nishiki family is still a thing and are now the biggest family in the clan. And of course they all have a vendetta against Kiryu. Majima's back and he's not with the Tojo anymore. Yeah, that was another surprise. He's something else entirely. He's transcended to a new realm of being. Honestly, when I was making the relation chart, I was half debating giving Majima his own category of Majima construction. <laughs> And then we also find out that Sayama's parents were potentially killed by the Tojo clan. Potentially. I'm assuming that they probably won't. Is that another bet you want to put down? Yeah, because I feel like they're going to make a big... Well, then again, they could double buff it, but I feel like it probably... If they're going to make this bigger an impact on it, it probably won't be that. I'm I'm main, I'm main. largely glad to see Majima back. That was, that was definitely a highlight for me. It wasn't under the circumstances I ever would have expected. I don't think my last moments I could have predicted that would happen. That's another thing I feel like pointing out. In the remake of Yakuza 2, 
they actually added an unlockable three chapter prologue where you actually get to play as Majima. It's basically there to both try and give a better explanation as to why he left the clan, as well as to basically tie up loose ends from his story in Zero, which was the prequel. Hmm. I won't divulge what happens here because obviously I'm just talking about what was in the PS2 game. Chapter 6, Schemes. I wonder if there's going to be schemes. We open with Date and Kawara inside Stardust, with Date and Yuya catching up with each other after a year. Yuya thanking him for helping out the club in town, whilst Date thanks him for helping out his daughter, Saya, who's now gone to a cosmetology school, with Yuya having also moved up in the world by becoming Stardust's new manager. Kazuki then enters, with Date introducing him to Kawara, though he seems to get slightly phased when he mentions Kawara is with the police. Yuya heads off so the three can speak in private, Date then telling Kazuki that in one hour, a group of investigators are going to enter the club, saying they're raiding all kinds of establishments after the Millennium Tower bombing, due to them believing a foreign organization did it. The logic being that if they let something on that scale go unpunished, it makes them look incompetent. So they plan to send out 400 officers to round up all the illegal immigrants in one go. 400. Jesus Christ, talk about overkill. Kazuki claims no one employed for him is one, though Kawara claims they can still get busted by vice laws suggesting that it'd be better to close the club early tonight than to be permanently shut down. Kazuki asks why they're telling him this, Date saying it's to make up for all the trouble he caused last year. Kazuki takes his leave, Kawara saying that if he's Mafia, he's going to run off to tell his buddies straight away. Date still doesn't believe Kazuki could be Mafia, though Kawara believes that given what they pulled off, they're not likely to be caught easily. Kazuki closes the club early with Date not seeing anything suspicious. However, whilst the two seemingly have their backs turned, Kazuki suddenly runs out the building with Date and Kawara giving chase, running past Yuya. I'm hoping we just go into like a Scooby-Doo chase scene. Back over to Kiryu and Sayama, who are getting ready to head towards the Yamano building. On the way out of Serena, they end up getting spotted by Yuya, who fills Kiryu in on what happened with Kazuki and Date. Kiryu telling him that once he's got more time, that he'll meet up with him and to give a call if something comes up. After some running around, Kiryu eventually finds the Amano building, with him also having to fight a gang named 16-Bit in order to get a key to enter, with Kiryu telling Sayama to wait outside for him. Once inside, Kiryu works his way through the building, along the way fighting swarms of foreign men all wearing black clothing. You know they're badasses that they're wearing black clothing. I was thinking it's more like a uniform of sorts. Yeah. <laughs> Once Kiryu gets to the roof, instead of finding Daigo, he runs into Date, Kawara, and two Kazukis. Wait, you say two Kazuki? Twins, right? It has to be. Kiryu rightfully asks, what the hell is going on? Date stating they trailed Kazuki here and ended up finding two of him, the two both claiming to be the real Kazuki. That's so weird. The, no, the plot twist is the triplets and they're both not the real ones. Date then asks why Kiryu's here, him saying it was due to a planned meeting, effectively confirming it was a trap. Kawara then brandishes his gun, claiming he's figured out which one is the fake, saying he can change his face all he wants, but he can't change his voice, him demanding he explain why he brought them there. Date then starts pointing his gun at Kawara, claiming he doesn't want to see Kawara kill someone in front of him again, asking how he can make his claims without any proof, leading to a back and forth between the two over how Kawara seemingly kills based on gut feelings, before the fake Kazuki pulls out two pistols pistols and shoots both Kawara and the real Kazuki. We're seeing characters from previous games get maimed left and right. 
The fake Kazuki then reveals he was the one who called Kiryu, revealing the whole plan was to lure him and the cops here, then create a fake scenario where the four had a fight with and then killed each other. What? Oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> Um, I think I'm fucking malfunctioning, because... Oh, okay. You know what? Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Kawara starts telling Date to shoot him, though the bullet ends up grazing his forehead, at which point the fake Kazuki starts speaking Korean. A gunshot then rings, with the fake Kazuki then collapsing, him having been shot by Sayama, who ran up when she heard the gunshots. The fake Kazuki is now dead with the group deciding to run when they hear police sirens, believing there's something more to this setup. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> what is happening? I'm so conf- I'm <laughs> My god, I'm so confused. I'm so confused. But yeah, that was chapter 6. <laughs> Wait, that's it? That what was, the fuck is that was happening? surprisingly short. Yeah, most of the time is spent with Kiryu running around to find the key to the Amano building, and then the fight up there against the um, strange foreign men in black outfits. So, let's just address the elephant in the room. Yeah. What the fuck is with... Fake Kazuki. Are we gonna are we gonna like Right so basically he pretended to be Kazuki for for a while. Uh with the end goal of luring Kiryu, Date, and Kawara to the rooftops, where he would then kill all of them and then frame the situation in such a way that it makes it look like the four of them basically killed each other. That has to be the most convoluted, ridiculous plan I've ever heard in my entire life. Chapter 7, The Foreign Threat Sayama distracts the police outside whilst Kiryu and Date carry Kazuki and Kawara to a clinic ran by a Dr. Emoto. Guess I should mention, Dr. Emoto is kind of like Yaoyoi Dojima, where he was a character introduced in like a sub story in Yakuza 1, but is now main plot relevant. All you really need to know about him is that he runs a clinic in Kamurocho and it's revealed he gets his funding from the Kazama family. He had to wait until he was main story important. Once they get there, they prioritise Kazuki, who's quickly taken to the operating room. Emoto saying he'll take care of them, but asks that if someone's after them, that they head out to avoid the clinic getting attacked. Which I think is fair. Yeah, no, no. Yep, I would, I would say that's fine. With Kiryu and Date agreeing to share notes at Bantam, a bar which replaced Bacchus after the incident last year as it's a good distance away from both Stardust and the Amano building. With them also both agreeing to not tell the Stardust workers what happened for now, in order to help prevent them from worrying about what happened and make sure they don't end up becoming targets. That is also fair. However, Yuya ends up running over, saying a woman spotted the two carrying Kazuki into the clinic. With them telling him he got shot, but lying that he just got hit by a stray bullet during a Yakuza scuffle, with them also telling him to not go after them as, given they don't know how long it's going to take for Kazuki to recover, he needs to watch over the club in his stead. Once they get to the bar, they ask the owner if they can temporarily close so the two can exchange notes. After the two fill each other in, Kiryu is left confused, wondering why someone is trying to kill them off. Date figuring Kazuki was just the bait, but is stumped on what they would gain and what the common link is between him and Kiryu. Kiryu mentions how the person who tipped him off on the foreign group that kidnapped Daigo and Jin was Besho, Date recognising the name as he used to be a detective for Kamurocho's organised crime division. Besho having joined around the same time as Kawara, the two being nicknamed Besho the Viper and Kawara the Demon, both being legends on the force by the time Date joined. 
I don't even have those names. That's already in and of itself suspicious. Kiryu asked Date what he meant about Kawara's kills. Date saying that when he joined the police force 15 years ago as a rookie, he was partnered with Kawara, who was a squad leader at the time. The two having been sent out to investigate illegal immigrants whilst trying to track down a murder suspect. Kawara was a regular cop at the time, but he was famous for having a clean record. Date hoping he could learn some pointers from him by tagging along. However, when the immigrants resisted, Kawara just immediately pulled out his gun, proceeding to massacre all of them. Holy shit. This immediately causing Date to lose any respect for him as in his eyes, the police are supposed to be the protectors of peace, with shooting being a last resort. And when he asked Kawara how he could kill all those men without batting an eye, all he had to say was, they left me no choice, this is on them. I don't understand him. I, 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 I don't understand. Date adding that Kawara would continue to pull off similar stunts and every time it was written off as self-defense, though it eventually led to him getting the nickname Killer Kawara and he was eventually transferred divisions, with the image of the men being gunned down being permanently etched into Date's mind. That's so stupid that they just like transported the guy who just murders everyone. Surely you just sack him. Kiryu assumes that Kawara must have some deep scars. Date feeling the same, though Kawara would never go into it. Though it's apparently not just from a general hatred of foreigners. Him saying that he can tell Kawara has some heavy baggage, he just wishes he could understand what it is. Kiryu commenting that maybe deep down Date still cares about him. How can you have like any hope towards someone who's just so absurd. After going outside, Kiryu gets a call from Sayama, who's just gone to the clinic, with him deciding to head over there to meet her. Over at the clinic, she ends up talking with Kawara, starting by saying that smoking doesn't suit her, before giving Sayama her badge, saying she dropped it when she went for her gun. Sayama points out that he's awfully calm for someone who's been shot, him saying, you get used to it. And when he, she says the Tokyo police experience more action, he claims it's the same everywhere and he's just lucky. That's the most buddy cop thing ever. Like, oh my god, you just got shot. Are you in pain? It's like, you get used to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kawara then asking how she ended up working for the police, only for her to shut him down. Kiryu then enters, with Kawara saying he's fine whilst Kazuki is still under operation. Just then, two men in all black barge in and head for the operating room punching out a moto before speaking in Korean to see if the person on the table is Khan. After getting their answer, when Kazuki asks who they are in Japanese, they go to leave but are stopped by Kiryu picking up they must be in the foreign gang responsible for kidnapping Daigo and Jin. Sayama trying to question them before getting punched as well, which then spurs Kiryu to start a fight with the two Korean men. Just punching all around. <laughs> After beating them, Kawara threatens them at gunpoint to tell them who they work for, them saying they're part of a Korean syndicate called the Jingwampa. Just then, sirens start blaring, with the three deciding to head over to meet with Date at Bantam. Once there, Date is sat by himself as the bar's owner has stepped out for the time being, Kawara telling Date about how they found out the group's name which, when translated, means the True Fist Faction, with him explaining that he managed to pick up some Korean during the job. Again, body cop. <laughs> Kiryu and Date also believing that the Jingwon must be the organization that kidnapped Daigo and Jin. I guess I should also mention this. Apparently, Yakuza 2's Korean pronunciation is infamously terrible. So if I'm pronouncing Jingwon wrong the whole time, that's the game's fault. <laughs> Date then says that he thinks they should move, believing Bantam isn't safe anymore, 
Picking it up after he started noticing the bar owner kept coming and going like he's talking to someone, with him also finding pictures of both Kiryu and Sayama behind the bar. Sorry, that's oddly suspicious. Kiryu says he'll stay behind to ask the barkeep about them, telling the others to head over to Serena. When the barkeep gets back, Kiryu asks him about the pictures, saying he just wants to know what's going on. At which point, a bunch of workers from Kamarocho storm the bar with weapons, them all having the intention to kill Kiryu. Of course they do. With Kiryu simply finishing his drink before getting up to fight them off. He's so badass. And some things just never change. <laughs> After beating them, the bar owner begs Kiryu for forgiveness, saying he's deep in debt after people stopped coming to the bar due to what happened last year, adding that banks would constantly turn him away and he was getting hounded by loan sharks, only for a member of the Sengoku family to show up, saying he'd be willing to pay off any debts they owe in exchange for taking out Kiryu and Sayama. He says he didn't want to do it, but given his current situation, he had no other options. Kiryu decides to forgive the guy as he feels most of what happened last year was his fault, asking the barkey to just hold on a little longer in the hopes that trade will go up soon. It wasn't his fault though. It was Nishki's fault. It's all Nishki's fault. I feel, I feel like ironically, Kiryu offered the least amount of chaos to that whole fucking situation, honestly. Yes. I think you just need to understand something if it's not become very clear. Kiryu has a very, very big case of survivor's guilt. Yeah, oh. clearly he has like, too, like so much that he blames himself for everything. It's basically a case of whenever Kiryu's brought into help in these situations, he can only focus on how him getting involved has fucked things up instead of like how he's actually helped people ah yeah kiryu heads back to serena where he tells the group about the sengoku family's bounty before noticing they're all seemingly down it being revealed that after an investigation was done on the amano building Date is wanted for murder, the police surveillance cameras having picked up him shooting the fake Kazuki. How do you feel about the reveal of the proper reveal of the Korean mafia being involved? That's kind of cool. World building, yay. Oh yeah, also how do you feel about Kawara now knowing that he's shot up entire groups of foreigners for seemingly no reason? I mean, he, he literally, he sounds like a character from Hotline Miami, so <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know why, but I also kind of expected it. Yeah, I mean with a name like Killer Kawara, it's not exactly subtle. <laughs> It's like, oh, he, he's. What did he just get that name? Oh, he kills people. <laughs> Whoa, did not expect Whoa. that. But yeah, uh, I also want to add that uh, Date mentioning that that situation is burned into his mind. I think that's also supposed to be like the in universe explanation as to why Date basically never uses his gun. Yeah, I mean, like, if, if you saw your hero shooting up a bunch of seemingly innocent people, then that would probably traumatize you a bit. Chapter 8. Suspect. It's about Date? Yeah. Over at the police HQ, Sudo and Kurahashi are shown the footage of Date shooting the fake Kazuki. I've heard those air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> I, could, I could sense them in the script. <laughs> with the commissioner also bringing out a bullet that was found at the scene belonging to Date's gun. That's not good. And despite the fact that he was brought in as a contract worker for a secret mission, he's still a civilian and therefore shouldn't have a firearm. He should go to America because they love it, you know? They won't even mind. They'd be like, yeah, we'll give you we'll give you one, we'll give you another one. They bring up how they brought Date in to find the identity of a foreign organization. Kurahashi telling the commissioner it's the Jingguan. However, he doesn't believe them as apparently the Jingguan were wiped out years ago. These plot twists, man. 
them then explaining how they'd been tracking the groups for months, suspected Kazuki was one of them, and then brought in Date as someone on the force Kazuki would trust. The commissioner understands their logic, but says they still need to arrest Date as the video going public would cause a massive ex-cop scandal, with him declaring that the homicide division is both taking on the search for Date and will now be in charge of the Jingwon investigation. And after he leaves, Kurahashi he tells Sudo he'll think of something to help Date, as he's the one responsible for Date getting involved. I love how suddenly everything just kind of span around on Date. He got like yeah. handed the strongest Uno reverse card ever in history. Oh, what's that? You just wanted to uh, enjoy your quiet life whilst your daughter is going to cosmetology school? Bam, you're now wanted for murder. Back at Serena, they discuss the video hiding what really went down, and when Sayama suggests going down and explains she's the one who shot him, Kawara says not to bother as given the police already screwed up by bringing in a civilian on a top secret mission, and they already have evidence with the video and a bullet from his gun, they'll just ignore whatever Sayama has to say and pretend they had no involvement. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Kiryu picks up that the footage most likely came from the florist, though that's pushed aside as Date reckons the situation means they need to speed things up on finding the Jingguan, Kawara suggesting Date skip town to avoid getting caught by the police, with Kiryu having his own plan of paying the florist a visit in order to hopefully track down where Daigo is and then from there maybe find the Jingguan. Fair enough. Kiryu looks like he's got a a good plan. Kawara heads off with Date whilst Kiryu and Sayama go to the Millennium Tower to see the florist. When they get to his office, he greets Kiryu, before reading off all the information he's been able to find about Sayama, saying he's been tracking the two since they got to Kamurocho, along with doing some homework on the side. And because of that, he knows Kiryu's here to figure out where Daigo is. The florist also confirms that the footage being used against Date came from him, the florist feeling responsible for Date being accused accused of murder as, if he had seen the video, he wouldn't have handed over such a flimsy video as evidence, claiming it was submitted when he wasn't present, suggesting there's a rat working for the florist. This not being helped by the fact that, given how elaborate his security system is, he should have been able to spot the guy who bombed the Millennium Tower, but for some reason the relevant information never showed up, though he's not sure who it could be, as all the people working for him are friends from his days in purgatory, and he can't see any of them betraying him. One of them shouts that they've managed to spot Daigo, however before they can give a location, the power cuts out due to trouble in the transformer room. They temporarily switch over to the emergency power and use it to show that people are attacking the generators with sledgehammers, Kerry then heading down to take out the attackers. Sorry, I just wasn't expecting sledgehammers. I, I mean, they're large generators, so you're gonna need something like a sledgehammer. True. I just wasn't expecting to see such a, a large, ridiculous weapon as I probably should have. After defeating most of them, the last one steps out and reveals himself to be Hiroshi Hayashi, the Omi Lieutenant Advisor Kiryu fought last year, him claiming he now works for the Goryu clan instead of the main Omi Alliance, claiming his only goal now is to help Ryuji get to the top, leading to a rematch between the two former lieutenants. This sounds like it's gonna be good. Oh it is, it's literally one of the best boss fights in the game. <laughs> nice. Let's <laughs> go. 
After defeating him, they turn the power back on and comment that if Ryuji is sending in former Omi officers after them, he means serious business. With the main power back on, the florist gets his men to get back to finding Daigo's location. However, the rat has hacked into the system and is preventing access to their cameras, then believing it to be another surprise from the Goryu clan. However, Sayama is able to fix it as, according to the florist, she mastered in programming at a tech college, which is what got her hired by the police by entering as an engineer for the high-tech crime unit under foreign affairs, with her then applying to work for organized crime right after she got placed. I wonder if those skills have been handy a few chapters ago. After Sayama gets the systems up again, they finally identify where Daigo is. He's being held captive in Shangri-La, which has been abandoned ever since Majima crashed a truck into the side of the building. God damn it, Majima. Where are people going to go for their um, non-penetrative sex? <laughs> <laughs> what, what other buildings will people be able to drive vans into? Yeah. Exactly! The florist warns Kiri that given what just happened, they likely already know he's coming down there. Though Kiri reckons that they were already trying to lure him by bringing Daigo to Kamurocho in the first place. The florist then warning Kiri to be careful. Once they get there, Kiri tells Sayama to stay back as the place is incredibly dangerous. Kiri then fights his way through the abandoned soapland against various Omi men, eventually finding Daigo tied up and being monitored by four remaining goons, Sayama running up to help out during the final fight. <laughs> After the fight, Kiryu unties Daigo, who says that Jingoda is somewhere else and apologises for getting caught. Kiryu then saying sorry for taking so long to get to him. He then asks if Daigo's okay, who then says he's dying. Not because they broke anything, but in his own words, because he's fucking starving. <laughs> <laughs> Kiryu reckoning he'll pull through. I was genuinely worried for a sec. That's the end of chapter 8, and by extension, we're now at the halfway point of the story. Do, 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 do. First of all, what did you think of chapter 8? I, en I enjoyed it quite a lot. It was definitely chaotic, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Probably more so than the other chapters, and that's quite saying something. Yeah, but uh, we've also finally saved Daigo! Yay! And only one person's died. Yes. We're halfway through and we've only had one death so far. Especially considering that this is like, I would say, more crazy than y Yakuza 1. And just like, this one is definitely above par when it comes to the craziness of the chapters we've seen so far. I was just about to ask as well, given we're now at the halfway point, how do you feel it compares to Yakuza 1 so far? It's it's a lot better. I, I think well, that like, I think one of the things is that like, Yakuza does the chaos really well and while for two it came later, we got a lot more. Yeah, it it doesn't really pull any punches. I feel like narratively, Yakuza One is better in the sense of like, oh, here's like it tells you what you need to know. Yakuza Two doesn't really tell you anything, but I guess it doesn't really have to. I think some of that's still being held back for later. Yeah, because mm. I think in addition, because not only is like Yakuza Two longer, like it's three chapters longer, but I think we can all agree it's like story is a lot more dense and has a lot more moving parts yeah it's also expanding on the world building in a way that i didn't expect but i do quite like i also found it like bizarre how like subverting like the subplots because i thought Darte was going to go in as like subplot of like of like detective work and stuff like that and it turns out he just got completely uno reversed and he was just oh shit he's, yeah <laughs> he's getting quite screwed over now Chapter 9, The Omi Invasion. Oh, invasions. That's actually not a good thing. Never mind. I don't know why I'm so excited. <laughs> excited and then immediately regrets it. Back at Serena, Daigo is talking about his kidnappers, mentioning how they acted more like a military than a gang. Just then, Kashiwagi enters the building to check on Daigo, and when he asks who nabbed them, he seemingly recognises the name Jingguan. He confirms that he's heard of them, 
Harper believed they were wiped out. And when Sayama mentioned she called in the HQ to ask, only to be told they have no records on the Jingwan Mafia, Kashiwagi claims the reason for that is due to them being unknown to the public and the police themselves having erased any record of them. He then explains that back in 1980, the Dojima family would fight back against various foreign gangs in Kamurocho, the Jingwan being their biggest threat. One night, Dojima called in what were his two best men at the time, Shintaro Kazama and Futoshi Shimano, and told them to raid the Jingwan office and kill every member in the building. That seems on brand with what we've seen so far. Kazama was hesitant about wanting to wipe them out, however Shimano is more than willing to do it given how many men they've lost to them, with Dojima explaining the only reason he's going this far is due to how low the Jingwan are willing to go, feeling that if they don't take care of them soon, the Dojima family will die, adding that if they strike too soft, they've effectively dug their own graves, leaving a total wipeout as the only option. So what they do to put salt in the earth? Mm. Essentially. Basically. Despite Kazama being against the plan, he had to go along with it. With him and Shimano murdering every last one of them, the end result being the Dojima family becoming the de facto rulers of Kamurocho, with Shimano not too long after starting his own family, with the Tojo also using the incident's momentum to spread all over Kanto, with the Jingwon's recent return suggesting there might have been some survivors, said survivors then allying themselves with the Goryu clan. I guess that's one way to turn people against you. Sayama then asks where the police police were during the incident, Kashiwagi claiming the cops didn't have a solid lead on the Jingwan at the time, so they effectively just let the Dojima family do the job for them, saying she'd have to ask the case's detective for the details, though he doesn't remember who that was. Kiryu and Kashiwagi wonder who's going to make the next move, as Jingoda's still missing, the Goryu can invade at any minute, the remnants of the Jingguan are back, and they still haven't found the rat who set up Date. Daigo's saying it doesn't matter who it is, as they'll need to beat them regardless. So yeah, basically we've got a lot of enemies right now. <laughs> Yeah, and no real leads on said enemies. The next morning, Kiryu and Daigo head to Tojo HQ for Tarada's funeral. The two tell Yaoyoi about the Goryu and Jingwon, her reckoning that if the two are working together, then bloodshed is inevitable, the top priority now being to find Jingoda, as the truce going through would prevent the Goryu from being able to do anything. Suddenly, shouts are heard from outside, the three running out to see what's up, with Shindo being seen standing back smirking. Oh no, if he's smirking then you know that someone's about to go down. <laughs> Once outside, it turns out the Go Ryu clan have decided to crash the funeral, them claiming Ryuji isn't with them but they're here to take down Kiryu. Of course they are. <laughs> Once the fight is over, a final set of cars arrive with Ryuji stepping out in full formal attire, claiming his men were acting out of order, with him having come down to pay respects to Tarada. And despite a telling off from Kashiwagi, some teasing of the Tojo's current state, him throwing around Daigo, and him explaining the reason he's hiding Jin to prevent the truce is due to him not viewing the Tojo and Omi as equals, his respect for Tarada seems to be legit, with him bringing incense and monetary offerings in his memory. Though the Tojo turns down the Goryu's money, with Yaoyoi calling him a disgrace to his father's name, with Ryuji then revealing he doesn't care, as he's not Jin's biological son, them only sharing a mutual hatred. That's... I mean, I don't really know what like effect that has on the greater scope of things, but oh my god! Before leaving, he then warns them that his invasion of Kamurocho will begin in three days. However, he also mentions that Sengoku is already starting his own takeover right now. 
They were distracted by having feelings. Ha! Pathetic. <laughs> it's an underhanded tactic, but a smart one, to say the least. Yeah, I think that's what we're starting to learn about Ryuji. He's a bit of a scumbag, but he does still have respect for the Yakuza code. Yeah, which I think is, I, to be honest, that's the bare minimum. Back in Kamurocho, we see helicopters flying overhead with an army of Yakuza walking through the streets, only to be stopped by a man with a Hanya tattoo and a construction helmet. Oh, here we go. Majima! Majima simply smirking before taking on the entire group by himself. Let's go! <laughs> Once Kiryu gets back to Kamurocho, he gets a call from Sayama, telling Kiryu she got the info about an Omi invasion. The two meeting outside Purgatory before heading out to send the Sengoku family packing, only to find out that Majima already took out the entire family by himself. Man, he's so... Cool. Though he's been left bloody and bruised, collapsing on the ground by the time Kiryu and Sayama find him. He tells Kiryu he has to get back to Tojo HQ, revealing Sengoku's invasion was just a distraction to get Kiryu out so they could take over, the clan having been sold out by Shindo. With Sayama then stepping in to take Majima to a clinic whilst Kiryu runs back to HQ. So yeah, it turns out Shindo is also a traitor, just like Nishiki. Who could have seen it coming? Wow, how amazing it must be to be like Nishiki. That must be such an honor. <laughs> it was almost like, imagine, it's almost like he, he served under and, and learned from Nishiki or something. Yeah, it's almost like he was Nishiki's, like, literal right-hand man and the previous captain of his family. Yeah. Honestly, whenever anyone brings up Nishiki, my skin just goes pale and I just want to die. <laughs> <laughs> Once Kiryu gets there, he ends up finding that most of the guards have been taken down, with him fighting off some Nishiki armor family members before reaching the meeting room. The officers being tied up and held at gunpoint, with Shindo caressing Yaoyoi before Kiryu enters. Like, so Shindo's a creep too? Yes! Right. In case you already didn't hate him enough. <laughs> He's now worse than Nishiki, I, I'm sorry. Shindo claims that Tojo is currently on its last legs, with him revealing that as they speak, Sengoku's hitmen are wiping out the remaining officers, with us then seeing some of those assassinations. Holy shit. Shindo reveals his goal is to take over the Tojo as chairman, with the addition of taking Yaoyoi as his own, forcing a kiss before getting bitch slapped. Rightfully bitch slapped. Basically, Shindo fucked over the entire clan because he wanted to fuck Yaoyoi. That, that's, that's a whole new low. Kiryu asks him if he has any idea what he's doing, with Shindo claiming Kiryu is just as guilty as he is given his and Nishiki's war of a Yumi is what fucked over the clan. I can sense the hatred in that silence. This is just... Like, I, I, I'm uncomfortable now. <laughs> Yaoyoi claims there's no way in hell she'd be with Shindo, him proclaiming that Dojima had countless mistresses and that he can make her happier than Dojima ever could. Yaoyoi claiming that even though Dojima may have been with other women, he was the only man for her, that not changing despite his death. Kiryu then saying given her deep-seated love for Dojima, Yaoyoi is too strong for Shindo before a fight breaks out, after Shindo claims whatever he wants, he takes by force. Adding that with Kiryu's death, he'll become the next chairman. He's somehow more cartoonishly evil than Nishiki. I mean, the only person who could be more cartoonishly evil than Nishiki is the guy who took over after Nishiki died. I feel like comparing the, the cartoonishness of Shindo and Nishiki, Nishiki's more like Tom and Jerry, but Shindo's more Coraline. <laughs> Hmm. 
Finally knocking him down, as well as beating up two remaining Nishiki family men, sending their guns around the room in the process, Yaoyoi kicks Shindo out of the clan before moving on to untie the officers. However, Daigo notices Shindo reaching for one of the guns, with him then quickly diving for the other and shooting Shindo before he has a chance to kill anyone else. Before firing again to kill him due to Shindo screwing over the entire clan for his own perverted greed. Righteous justice, it's so sweet. I think this single action has already made Daigo the best character in the game. Yes! Yay, thank god. We don't need Nijiki 2.0, when 1.0 was just so fucked up. Kashiwagi apologizes for not being able to do anything. Yaoyoi saying it's not his fault, as there's not much you can do against a threat from the inside, with her declaring that if anyone sees the Omi and Kamurocho, to take no prisoners. Just to explain, like, the, the emotional roller coaster that's just been this past chapter. Mm. Like, Shindo, we, we knew who he was. He was he was the head of the Nishiki, the Nishiki armor family. And we just thought he was an annoying guy who we probably thought was going to do something bad mm. or stupid. Not only did he do something bad or stupid, he did something that was insanely fucked up. Mm. And then when Kiryu called him out on it, he went to Kiryu and went, You and I are the same! And then Batman, which which made us hate him so much more than we already did. Mm. And in that very same chapter, he's killed by Daigo. Yeah. And not to mention, before all of that went down, we also got the hype of Majima taking on the entire Sengoku family. Yes. The, OK, I, I want to say this might be a hot take. This is the best chapter so far. Chapter 10, Survivors. Date and Kawara are over at the police department's infamous Archive Room 13, Date having found the report on the Jingguan Massacre, with Kawara acting a bit odd, saying he's not surprised Date found it, before telling him to look at the last page, which states that the officers in charge of investigating the case were Kawara and Besho. How is he acting much more strangely than when he just committed mass murder? I know. <laughs> How do you act stranger than that? Him revealing this was the reason he took on the current case in the first place, volunteering after hearing that Kurahashi was tracking down the Jingwon, saying he did it because he owes them one. He then leaves his badge with Date, saying his work is done, and the rest is up to him, on the way out claiming he's done answering questions. Jesus Christ, man. You just have to just assume that everyone's evil. Except Kiryu. Yeah. yeah. Date tells Kiryu and Sayama what he discovered and what happened with Kawara. Sayama is upset that Besho hid this information from her. Date saying that he picked up on Dojima's plan, but decided to pull a few strings and let them get away with it. Him's guessing Besho did it because he felt it was the fastest way to make Kamurocho safe again, with the higher-ups eventually finding out and then transferring him to Osaka. I'm just trying to soak that all in. Kiryu advises that Date should probably stop investigating for his own safety, him firing back that it's too late to drop out now, then asking what Kiryu's next plan is, and since they still don't know where Jin is, Kiryu's going to head after Ryuji by going back to Sotenbori. Seems fair. 
Once they get back, Sayama says she'll come with Kiryu, but needs to get a few things ready first. So, whilst she does that, Kiryu decides to wander around town, where he ends up running into the florist's son, Takashi. Remember him? Yeah, there was a little side chaps with him and his girlfriend. I wonder how he's doing now. Though he's seemingly got a new girlfriend and isn't with Kyoka. Oh, okay. I guess that's a media answer to the question then. Leading Kiryu to believe his whole speech about doing whatever it takes to help Kyoka was bullshit and he's just another punk. Takashi quickly asking Kiryu if he can let him explain. They head over to a bar where he explains that he worked as hard as he could, working in all kinds of industries, only for him to get made fun of wherever he went, leading him to lose them fairly quickly. Basically, he couldn't stand the workplace banter. <laughs> he is just, like, a kid. He then adds that apparently Kiyoka has been seeing another man on the side, saying when he asks her why she's going out, she claims to be going out with friends. But he felt something was up, with one of his co-workers also saying he saw her enter a hotel with a man. Oh dear. Kiryu calls him pathetic for not even trying to find out if it's true or not, with Takashi then asking Kiryu if he knows about a supposed legendary info broker who knows about everything that happens in town. I wonder who Takashi could be talking about. Kiryu then confirming he knows about the florist. Takashi then saying he wants to meet with him, with Kiryu leaving to see if the florist will do so. Kiryu asks the florist if he'll see his son, with him initially stating he doesn't even want to see him given how pathetic he's acting, adding that he's not the father type. Bird ends up agreeing to meet, but only professionally. I love how I just take every moment to call him pathetic, just every single time. Well, I mean, he is a bitch. <laughs> Kiryu then brings Takashi over, the florist treating him like any other regular customer, agreeing to show him what Kyoka's been doing, though he gives a warning that some info is not worth learning, but Takashi says he can handle it. They find footage from a week ago of her organizing to meet someone, her saying it's safe because Takashi's out. She then heads into the hotel and waves someone over. But it turns out to be Kyoka's dad. The footage revealing she's been borrowing money off of him due to Takashi struggling to keep a stable job. Him saying that they moved out too soon and that she's welcome to come home anytime. However, she says it's okay as she believes in Takashi. As whilst he's not quite figured things out yet, she knows he'll get there in the end. Which is why she's supporting him now, claiming that even if it takes a decade, they'll pay him back. Damn it, Takashi. Takashi realizes that he's being a jackass and promises to Kiryu that he'll get his shit together. <laughs> Kiryu telling him to go back to Kyoka, whilst the florist tells him to get a job and stop running away the moment things get tough, and that his father would be ashamed. Takashi asks if he can tell him about his father, the florist rebutting that he can only tell him when he can afford it, which won't happen until he can support himself and Kyoka first, with him claiming the info he gave today was free out of respect respect for Kiryu. Oh my god. And then when he leaves, Kiryu's just like, oh, you're being awfully daddish, aren't you? Just giving your information for free. And he's just like, shut up, it's going on your tab. Ah, uh, some great dad floors. <laughs> Sayama then calls Kiryu, saying she's ready to go. When he gets back to Serena, he asks why she's loading her gun. Sayama claiming after learning what she has about the chief, she can't trust anyone. Kiryu thinks that Besho hasn't betrayed her, but Sayama claims she had to work incredibly hard to get to where she is now, with Besho having been the one person she could rely on, only to find out he was making deals with the Yakuza behind her back, saying that when they get to Osaka, they have to make a detour to the police department. Kiryu says she can do whatever she wants, but he needs to find Jingoda. Sayama then pulling a gun on him, saying he's still in her custody and doesn't get a choice. Kiryu then agreeing to come with her. You just can't trust anyone in this series. Everyone has ulterior motives. Once they arrive at Osaka PD, they talk to Besho inside one of the interrogation rooms. Sayama confronts him about how they know about his involvement in the Jingwon massacre, as well as the Jingwon's involvement in recent events and ask him if there's anything else he's hiding from them. He claims all he knows is what happened back then, as he has no way of knowing what's going on now, explaining he didn't tell Sayama about the Jing Wan as he didn't know there was a connection, so he wasn't just going to tell her classified information. That's, that's pretty fair. Yeah, that's fair enough. 
They then ask him what he knows about the massacre. He explains the reason why he let the Dojma family carry out the hit was because there was nothing the police could do themselves to stop the Jingguan, as they couldn't get anything to charge them with under the law. And despite him telling Sayama that making deals with the Yakuza leads to corruption, he genuinely felt there were no other options. She then asks how they could be doing so well for an organization that was supposedly wiped out. He tells them that at the time, the Jingguan was made up of 36 people, but that night, they only found 33 bodies, meaning three members somehow managed to survive the attack. I love how they use the word only 33 bodies. With Besho actually knowing about one of them, he tells them he hangs out at a place called Kema near the Su Tenkaku Tower, the guy now living under the name Mirai. Besho stating that he was the one who brought him to Osaka and gave him the name Mirai. He states that it was a miracle Mirai survived, revealing that the Jingwan live by the creed, death before dishonor, revenge coming before staying alive, with him having broken that creed, which is what led to Besho and Kawara helping him escape Kamurocho when they transferred to Kansai to avoid being hunted down by any remaining Jingwan members. Death before dishonor definitely sounds like a very healthy way to solve your problems. Besho then tells Sayama that her protective custody of Kiryu is over, since, if the Jingwan are involved, the situation has gotten too dangerous. Sayama first asking if it's because she's a woman, with him claiming it's gone out of her jurisdiction, and when Sayama tries to argue back, he claims that this isn't just any run-of-the-mill Yakuza hunt down like she's done before, claiming the Jingwan even view women and children as just more meat. That's the grossest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Yeah! And it's like, these guys are clearly worse than the Yakuza. After Sayama storms out, Besho asks Kiryu to look out for her, claiming he's the only one who can. But before he leaves, he asks if Kawara's shootings are related to the massacre or the transfer to Kansai. Besho saying he can't say any more than what's already been said. I feel like that's just a very cautious way of saying yes. <laughs> Yeah. Kiri then wanders around Sajutenbori, trying to figure out where Sayama got to. First stopping by Aoi, where Tamio suggests she's likely at a bar she regularly goes to called Stigil, with the Stigil barkeep then telling Kiri she just left, with her mentioning that she was going to the river. We see Sayama wandering down the riverside, before stepping in to stop a group harassing a couple, with her then having to fight off the group when they start trying to assault her with Kiryu stepping in, claiming to be her bodyguard. Again with Kiryu getting involved in other people's shit. <laughs> After defeating the group, he helps Sayama up, with her then grabbing Kiryu by the hand, helping him escape when some conveniently late police show up and start chasing them. After managing to hide from the cops, Sayama asks if Kiryu is free tonight, then asking if he wants to join her on a night out. The pair grab some takiyaki, hang out at the golf center before escaping after Sayama accidentally breaks one of the clubs. That's impressive. Play some patchy slots, and then play on a claw machine with Kiryu winning Sayama a teddy bear. This is... We then see the two on a building rooftop, Sayama having just gone back with drinks, Kiryu saying the place is nice, with Sayama saying it's her way of saying thanks for taking her out, as it's her secret spot. A while later, Sayama heads off to get another round, Kiryu replying she's being pretty considerate, the two then having a joking back and forth. Kiryu saying he finds it cute how she fights every compliment. Her then saying that people don't call her kind or cute as she's tougher than half the force, leading to most people being scared of her, leading her to no flattery when she hears it, adding she didn't bring Kiryu here so he could try and charm her. Kiryu simply saying the other guys just don't see her as both a cop and a woman, telling her to not let them tear her down, and that he believes the most important part of life is being yourself, saying that Sayama is pushing back so hard against every everything around her, that she might have lost herself in the process, saying someone will see the real her and cherish her for it. My god, Kiri, this man, this man is he's such too a charm. He's too pure! He's too powerful! <laughs> 
Sayama then says they should head out, as she's had one too many. She then says she had given up trying to find that kind of happiness, thinking the way she does is what got her this far and made her who she is, and that nobody would know how she felt but her. Kiryu says she's right, as he doesn't know much about her past, but despite what others say, he thinks she's a kind soul, though he admits it's just his opinion. Sayama saying it's pretty hard to believe Kiryu used to be a Yakuza, him stating that's his point, that until they get to know you, people's stereotypes don't mean anything. All the life lessons in this chapter, let's go. Kiryu tells her to be careful on the way back, given she's a bit tipsy, as he wants to watch the stars for a bit. Sayama starts saying she'll join him, only for Kiryu to interrupt about their plan to meet the survivor tomorrow, saying she should get some rest and that she doesn't have to worry about him running off. Kiryu mentioning that Sayama said she owed him for tonight, simply asking she take his advice. The two arranging to meet at the bridge tomorrow morning, with her thanking Kiryu before leaving. So basically after that entire situation, how hard do you ship Kiri and Sayama? Hard. It was like a reenactment of Gone with the Wind. So beautiful. Oh my god, this is so cute. Kiri decides to hit the town before going to rest, with him running into a man who is about to throw some art into the river before he stopped him. Recognising the guy's art as a tattoo design, the artist offering tea at his place. He hands the art to his apprentice, telling her to put it somewhere he won't find it. The tattoo artist says his name is Kazahori the Fourth, him being one of the best tattoo artists in Kansai. Kiryu having heard of him from his own tattoo artist Utabori the Second, Kazahori having similarly heard of him as the tattoo business is a small world. He begins explaining the tattoo, saying that the design is something passed down from previous generations, with only the acting Kazahori Kazahori being the one who can use it, the design being a golden dragon, the legendary lord of the four great gods. Nice. But before he can explain why he was getting rid of it, they overhear a noise with the apprentice Akina saying that Satoshi, Kazahori's first student, came in and stole the design, leading him to say he was going to get rid of it due to a succession war. Kazahori explains he's set to retire and wants Akina to take over, but given that the world of tattoos is a world of men, his oldest pupil Satoshi didn't like the idea, due to him being upstaged by a woman. Woman 10 years younger than him. The villains are just becoming increasingly misogynistic. However, he's still set on making Akina the next master, saying tattooists need more than a gender and experience to be one. They need to be able to see their clients' fates within their work, and Satoshi just isn't there yet. However, Akina is unwilling to take the name but she won't say why. Despite this, Kazahori isn't just going to give it to Satoshi just because Akina doesn't want the position, as he's not ready, but Satoshi having planned to just steal the design and call himself Kazahori the Fifth anyway. Kiri then gets up, saying he has a similar dragon tattoo. Kazahori saying the last time Utabori did a dragon tattoo was about 20 years ago, with it being his magnum opus. Kiri confirming he is that man and that Utabori taught him the weight and worth of a tattoo, which is why he's now going to help as he can't stand to see what Satoshi's done. Kiryu saying he'll get the design back if Akina explains why she won't take the Kazahori name. Kiryu tracks down the building Satoshi's in and beats the crap out of him and two of his underlings. <laughs> Kazahori and Akina then entering, him saying Satoshi's learnt the art of tattoos, but his soul is still empty, that being the difference between him and Akina, claiming tattoos can change a person's life and he's only interested in making money by giving them to two-bit street punks. Satoshi then asking if the last guy he gave the dragon tattoo is now some great hero, Kazahori revealing it to have been Ryuji Goda. I was wondering when we we're gonna hit him again. God. Satoshi's saying he has no right to lecture him as he gave his big special tattoo to Ryuji of all people. Akina then stepping in, stating she was the one who gave Ryuji the tattoo. What? 
Kazuhori explains that when Ryuji came in to have his tattoo done 10 years ago, he decided to give him the golden dragon. But after he started doing the outlines, his hands froze and he couldn't move a muscle, which is when Akina stepped in to finish the tattoo. That being the moment she learnt the weight of a tattoo, with her now being scared of giving men like Ryuji more power, after seeing how fast he climbed the ranks of the Omi after having the tattoo done. Fair enough. I, I can see how he would turn you off your occupation, probably for life. Kiri then reveals his own dragon tattoo. Staying ever since he took it, he's both gained and lost a lot. But the dragon and the way his life turned out are connected, him believing it's all fate. He tells them they weren't wrong for giving Ryuji the dragon, that it's easy for men with power to stray but it isn't their job to set them straight, saying the artist can lay the paths, but the man chooses which one to walk down. Oh, again, so much life lessons from Kiryu here. I know, so many just solid metaphors. He tells Akina that if the art weighs that heavily on her, how can she turn away from the Kazahori name on Ryuji's path? Him giving her best of luck before she thanks him and proclaims she'll stop running and accept the Kazahori name. Wow, I feel like that chapter, you can just like, you can hear the art community just like gyrating in their seats. Yeah. <laughs> So I think one thing I want to mention is that similar to chapter six in the first game, this kind of feels like they took two sub stories and then just made them mandatory story content. But instead of making it its own dedicated chapter, it just kind of sandwiches a chapter they had already written and realized was too short. Yeah. And then it also like, granted it is like completely a side chapter, but it has that bit, that big twist at the end that makes it relevant to the plot. Mm. It's like a jarring tone shift. Yeah. Cause it's like, we start with, the group finding out that Kawara was the detective on the Jingwon massacre case. Then it's like we get distracted by a side story with the Flora's son coming back. <laughs> then we basically get Kiryu and Sayama having a more believable love story than Kiryu and Yumi had in the first game. Yeah. And then we got distracted with a bunch of symbolic meaning of tattoos and learning about, I guess, the history of Ryuji's tattoo. I find it so absurd that like, Shindo, we died like a chapter ago, and then the, the very next second, Takashi suddenly shows up. It's like, oh, okay, we're gonna have filler then. Yeah. That's what he tends to do is just come in, have yeah. filler, and then go away. <laughs> it's like, there's so much stuff that's happened in this chapter, and it's like some of it is really, really good, but none of it is completely relevant to the whole to the story as a whole. No, I think literally the best thing to come out of this chapter is just Kiryu X Sayama. Yes. <laughs> Chapter 11, The Iron Creed Kiryu meets Sayama at the bridge, though he notices something seems to be troubling her. Sayama saying that after thinking about everything that happened last night, she has a bad feeling that she might be one of the Jingwon survivors. This being based on how Tamiyo saying the Tojo made Karu's life hell could be referring to her parents being killed in the massacre. Kiryu asks if she wants to cancel the meeting with Marai, but she doesn't want to run from her past, her then preventing Kiryu from having a smoke break before they leave. Let the man have a smoke. He deserves it. <laughs> The two head off to the Shin Seicho district, where they start their search to find Kaime, the place where Marai supposedly is, where after a long run around, they find out it's a secret shogi club near the Sutenkaku Tower. After getting in, they ask to play with Marai, who they find at the end of the room. Once they find him, he dodges questions, until Sayama suggests she might have been a survivor, Arai stating there was apparently a child who somehow survived that night. But when Sayama asks for details, he replies, if you can live without knowing, you'll be better off. Another vague one-liner. But when Sayama keeps pushing, he tells them about a shogi professional who, after making one fatal move in a major game, ended up losing, leading him to give up on shogi, eventually becoming an alcoholic and dying. Him using this to say that life can be cruel, 
and if she's managed to make it this far without knowing, she shouldn't burden herself with the information now. Siamis insists she can handle it, which is when Morai tells her what happened, saying the Dojima family burst in whilst they were celebrating Christmas, killing man after man, with three of them managing to survive. That is so evil. That isn't anything like the Christmas spirit. Marai fleeing to Osaka with the help of Kawara and Besho, however, men from the mainland were sent out to find him, with him not being caught as he sold them out. He claims he didn't sell out the other two survivors, who we learn are named Daijin Kim and Yong Min Ji, the two being 16 year olds at the time who somehow managed to get out. Though, he doesn't know where they are now. Instead, he sold out two other survivors. The boss's wife and her child. Oh, there we go. Oh my god. Oh my god. We then see a flashback to how Mirai survived, having been there to see Kazama gun down the boss, who, after seeing Mirai, pointed his gun at him before deciding to leave him alive, then watching the boss tell Kawara to save his wife, proceeding to then try and lift the boss before getting shot in the back by Shimano, the bullet just missing his heart, with him taking the name Mirai after that night. Kiri realises this means that if Sayama was that child, it would make the Jingwon boss her father. Marai explaining that the boss's wife and child were also brought to Kansai by Kawara, claiming he doesn't know what happened to them after he sold them out, with Sayama now fully believing that she is that child, then asking who the person who killed her father was. Marai saying he doesn't know his name, but remembers his face. And after mentioning the man's mustache, Kiryu realising he must be talking about Kazama, him being sure of it, as Kiryu was also at the shooting. What? <laughs> Just then, a group of Jingwon men enter the parlour, stabbing one of the workers, leading everyone else to run out, them confirming to be responsible for the bombings and kidnappings, along with thanking Kiryu for leading them to the deserter. Kiryu says he'll make them tell him where Jingoda is, however Marai says it's impossible, as these are elite members from the mainland, with Kiryu and Sayama then fighting the group. <laughs> After beating them, Kiryu grabs one of them, demanding they tell him where Jin is, only for another to throw their knife into Marai's stomach, with the members then opening their rings to ingest a powder which kills them. These guys are that hardcore. Marai revealing that's part of the code, him having been hunted down and killed for breaking it, saying he was a fool to think he could break fate and live a normal life, with him telling Sayama that he'll tell her mother that her child grew up right, and to find happiness before finally killing himself by pushing the knife in further, Kiryu then approaching to comfort Sayama before she storms off. <laughs> So basically now, we're learning of how many survivors there were. We've now got a suggestion that Sayama was the daughter who Kawara saved during the game's opening. And now we know Kiryu was present for the shooting. I swear to God, we need like a family tree or something. Just to know, because everyone seems to be like interconnected and related. Chapter 12, Osaka Castle. Is there a castle in Osaka? There is now! Over at the Sotenbori River, Kiryu asks Sayama if she'll hear him out, though she remains sat in silence. Kiryu explains that night he went to the Dojima family office, as Kazama would always visit the orphanage for Christmas but they hadn't seen him all day, so being worried something happened to him, he came down to Kamurocho by himself to see him. Kiryu picked up something was wrong when Kazama gave him the cold response of go home, leading him to follow the car Kazama left the office in. He says that Kazama was planning to ignore Dojima's orders by letting the Jingwon escape, 
but he didn't know that at the time. We see Kazama make the offer to the Jingwon boss that he'll let them live if they leave Kamurocho. However, Kiryu couldn't hear what they were saying, but could see that the Jingwon boss was pointing a gun at the man he considered his father. So, believing he was in danger, he grabbed a metal pipe off of the floor and charged in to protect him. The Jingguan boss then believes Kazama was luring him into a trap, with Kazama then shooting the boss before he could kill Kiryu. To be fair, he did point a gun at him, so it's not like, oh, it's a misunderstanding. It's like, well, that was completely impossible to know. Kiryu then watches Kazama kill the boss, him having done so to protect him. Because Kiryu believes the boss might have survived if he didn't show up, he's the person responsible for killing Sayama's father. That's a fair point. Correct. Sayama gets up and starts leaving, with Kiryu asking if she's going to shoot him, reminding her that he said he'd do anything to set things right. Right. Sayama then snapping at Kiryu to drop the tough guy act, telling him that his logic of everything magically being okay if he dies not being how the world works, and that life isn't that simple. Her then storming off, leaving Kiryu at the river. Poor Kiryu. After hours pass and rain starts coming down, Kiryu is still standing by the river, trying to light a cigarette whilst the words of what Sayama told him ring through his mind. Basically, Kiryu's in his sad boy hours. <laughs> a glass jar rolls up to Kiryu's feet, a local passerby having accidentally dropped it. Kiryu picks it up to give it back to the guy, but instead he seemingly walks past Kiryu, with Kiryu then looking down, dropping the jar upon seeing the knife in his gut. What the f- but, oh god. What? Kiryu didn't even notice being stabbed. <laughs> he was too perplexed by the jar, it was just so distracting. Yeah. Kiryu drops to the floor in his hands and knees, the stabber running off before Kiryu gets the strength to stand up again, him proceeding to tear the knife out of his body, with him then limping towards Aoi before he bleeds out. He manages to get there with Tamiya and Kawara being inside, only to pass out the moment he enters. We then shift over to the Sengoku family office, Sengoku being there alongside Ryuji and Takashima. Sengoku brings up what went down in Shinseicho, believing the Goryu clan to have done it, before Ryuji claims the Jingwon did it of their own volition, Sengoku retorting that they've done so much work for him he couldn't tell, joking that despite that it's not gone in him far. Ryuji asks if he's picking a fight, Takashima telling him to not let Sengoku get to him. Sengoku then claims he's got the Omi chairmanship in the bag, showing them he's kidnapped Haruka. What? Oh boy. With him planning to use her as bait to lure out and kill Kiryu. That was a development and a half. Takashima says the plan suits Sengoku, him retorting Kiryu's a tough guy to crack, Ryuji then leaving saying he's going to beat Kiryu and the Tojo his own way, Sengoku then proclaiming the race for the Omi throne is on. Kiryu wakes up, Tamiya telling him to take it easy, and explains Kawara was there to check on Sayama, though when Kiryu asks how she is, Tamiya immediately deflects and gives Kiryu a note that was in his jacket, the note having been put there by the stabber, it having a message from Sengoku stating, we have your child. So not only was this guy able to stab him without him knowing, he was also able to give him a note without him realising until now. That is just so many levels of impressive. Tamiya says she can't stop Kiryu, but he'd be pushing his luck given his wound. Kiryu gets up to leave, but before heading out asks if Sayama's been back, her saying to leave worrying about Sayama to Kawara telling Kiryu to be careful. After heading out, Kiryu ends up going around town fighting off various thugs who were hired to kill him, ending with a rematch against Isaki, the info dealer from the Mahjong parlor, where he's finally told that Sengoku and Haruka are in Osaka Castle. Oh, hence the name of the chapter. Upon reaching the castle, it then splits in half where a second castle covered in gold rises from the ground. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you say a castle made of gold rising it... from the ground? Yes. I oh my god. You were talking about Pokemon black and white. Now. That's what I was thinking. I was literally <laughs> what I was thinking. <laughs> it's oh M's my god. castle. <laughs> so basically, there's one of two explanations. There's the 
straightforward definition that's just like sengoku is such a rich man he literally built a castle out of gold and then put it underneath an actual castle like it's the lost city of atlantis or something however there's also a fan theory that suggests that the reason why this event and some of the stuff that happens later is so weird is because kiri is hallucinating from the stab wound he's got quite an active well, imagination then if that's true <laughs> kiri then enters and quickly encounters one of sengoku's men who tells Kiryu Haruka is in the central tower on the top floor, with Kiryu then proceeding to fight his way through the castle, dodging various traps and fighting family members dressed up in samurai gear. <laughs> Upon reaching the central tower, Sengoku commends him, being surprised he got this far, before presenting Haruka. Kiryu shouts to let her go, Sengoku then saying he'll wake up the pets, before sending in two tigers to kill Kiryu. Holy shit. I tell you man, this chapter gets weird. <laughs> After Kiryu defeats both tigers, Sengoku starts shitting himself, realizing who he decided to fuck with. Him proceeding to run up the stairs with Haruka, Kiryu chasing them, though he's clearly tired out by this point. The three enter Sengoku's office to a surprise. Ryuji is there. Oh, that's the most surprising thing that's happened. <laughs> Him getting up saying he sympathizes for Kiryu, having to put up with Sengoku's bullshit, with him then proceeding to slash Sengoku's body with his katana. You know what? This is the first time Ryuji's actually done something I can agree with. Sengoku calls him crazy, with Ryuji rebuting that he's just a man willing to do whatever it takes, like him, but calls kidnapping a kid as being low. Goku then claiming Ryuji would be nothing without his dad, at which point Ryuji stabs the entire sword through Sengoku before dragging and kicking him out of the window leading to his death. I think that's fairly justified. I love how we've just like gone into full... it's like fucking Katamari Damacy or some shit. <laughs> It's just, it's like suddenly we're just like in the chaos realm of ridiculousness. Ryuji then hands over Haruka and reminds him of his planned invasion the day after tomorrow. Kiryu saying he's ready for it. Kiryu then unties Haruka and apologizes for letting her get captured again, though he quickly begins to struggle because of his wound not healing. At which point, Sayama suddenly enters, helping to carry Kiryu saying it must have reopened. He asks why she followed him, explaining that Tamiya told her about the note, with the three heading out, not noticing that someone else was hiding in the corner of the room, turning out to be Kawara. I think chapter 12 is a chapter that is insane even by yakuza standards it's fucking weird <laughs> no i can see that yeah it's like did i just take acid and forget like i don't get it i think you can understand why there's a fan theory that this that for most of the chapter kiri's just hallucinating from the stab wounds because <laughs> that's the only way you can explain half this shit mm. yeah a hundred percent uh i will add though sengoku is actually dead so it, so it probably wasn't a hallucination if he's actually dead. I think it's a case of the gold castle rising from the ground. That's probably hallucination. Samurai armor was also a hallucination. The tigers were real though. <laughs> oh my god. Sure, you know, you know what? Sure. I think the, the 
the tigers were like the second most ridiculous part of this as well. It, it, it scratches into like the top 10. Chapter 13, Settling Accounts. Back at Aoi, Kiryu is getting patched up, with Sayama finding a note from Tamiyo, which reads, Your dad is still alive, honey. Don't blame Mr. Kiryu. Effectively disconfirming the idea that Sayama was the Jingwon boss's daughter, though it now raises the question of why he abandoned her and where her mother is. Sayama deciding to go around the neighborhood to see if she can find her for a better explanation. With Kiryu having some spare time, he decides to go on a day out with Haruka, as it's her first time going to Kansai. During their time out, they get spotted by a talent agent who tries to get Kiryu to sign over Haruka, as he sees her as having a potential career in show business, with Kiryu considering it as he believes that him being around is what has led her to being kidnapped four times. But decides against it when Haruka claims that because Kiri was around, she doesn't feel scared anymore because she knows he'll be there to save her and protect her, and that even if he did hand her over, she'd just run away to find him on her own. How nice. With them then making it up to the talent agent by introducing him to a bar waitress with a good singing voice. So yeah, again, slight bit where it feels like they made a sub-story main story content, but it's bonding moments with Haruka so it gets a pass. Once the two head back to Aoi, Kiryu gets a phone call. Date has been taken hostage by Kurahashi, who states that around 20 years ago, he used to go by the name Yongmin Ji, confirming himself as one of the massacre's survivors. I think he was going to be someone. He claims his actions have nothing to do with the Goryu clan, saying the time has come for the Jingwon to avenge their brothers who died 26 years ago. Date having been taken hostage in order to bring together everyone who ruined their lives that night. Them having taken over the florist's office in the Millennium Tower, demanding Kiryu be there by dawn, or this time, the entire building will go up in smoke. Also requesting he bring Sayama with him saying he'll only explain why when he gets there. Sayama, who got back during the call, says she was told about Date by the chief, adding that because the trains don't run this late, they'll have to drive back to Kamurocho. Whilst the three head out, we see Kawara alongside Tamio driving there as well, him talking on the phone with Besho, Kawara stating that their suspicions were right of a worst case scenario, with Besho saying the Osaka police will try to hold the omen me back as long as they can, Kawara heading after Kurahashi, Besho warning him to be careful as they have nothing to lose, Tamiya worries about Sayama finding out she has their blood, Kawara saying he won't let that happen, explaining this is why he's been hunting them down for the last 26 years. During the drive to Kamurocho, Sayama talks to Haruka about Kiryu whilst he's asleep, Haruka saying he always protects her, with Sayama saying she's only with him him because of work. Haruka then saying he seems to like Sayama, as he's been acting differently around her than he does with other people. Specifically, acting in a similar way that he does around Haruka, elaborating that Kiryu is usually quiet but really nice, with him often pushing himself for people asking for help, suggesting he doesn't have to worry when he's around Sayama so he can be himself. That's really sweet. Sayama comments that Haruka acts pretty mature for her age, her disagreeing, staying she and Kiryu just went through a lot of sad stuff together, so she just gets how he feels. Which, uh, yeah, I think that accurately describes Yoksa 1, just a lot of sad things happening to Kiryu and Haruka. Yeah, each of them more ridiculous than the last. Suddenly, the van is shot at, waking up Kiryu, them having been tailed by the Jingguan on trucks. Kiryu telling Sayama to floor it, whilst he jumps out of the van and onto the truck to fight the Jingguan. <laughs> Whoa. 
Once they get to Kamurocho, they leave Haruka at Serena before heading to the Millennium Tower, the two having to deal with some Jingguan members on the way there. They reach the florist's office where Kurahashi has destroyed all of the monitors. Sayama immediately points her gun at him, only to be told not to shoot by Date, who's been tied up with the florist and all his employees, saying the place has been wired to explode before Karahashi gets the rat to reveal the bomb. Sayama asks why she was brought here, Kurahashi saying she's a star in the revenge plot, confirming she has Jingguan blood, saying they want her to join their plan, only for Kawara to enter with his gun already being aimed, saying he's been watching Kurahashi since the day he became a Japanese citizen and joined the force, explaining that was the reason he left the homicide division to work in foreign affairs, having figured he'd let him go for abandoning the Jingguan, saying he should have never let him leave his sights. Kurahashi then threatens to blow up the building if Kawara takes one step closer. Kawara is telling him to go ahead, stating Kurahashi has been scraping by for 20 years by living a lie, claiming he doesn't have the balls to do it. Kurahashi retorting it's the Jingguan Creed to die for revenge, with Kawara shooting the bomb's controller out of his hand, then pointing it at his head when he goes to retrieve it, telling him to not give him that Creed crap, reminding him of Mirai who we find out was originally named Hyojong Park, him having managed to live under the weight of what he did, which given all the stuff that Jingwon did, proves he actually had a soul, before stating that Kurahashi would believe he deserved to die for breaking the creed. It's good to know that he has a soul. Kawara says the madness has to stop, and since Mariah's is dead, once he's taking care of him and Daijin, it'll all be over. Date shouts at him to stop, but Kawara demands he stay out of it, claiming if he doesn't end it now, more innocent blood will be spilled. Kurahashi then asking if he could kill a man whilst his daughter watches, revealing Sayama is Kawara's daughter. Wait, what? Well... <sighs> <laughs> God damn it. Kawara says he's lying and to stay back, him looking away giving Kurahashi a window to grab his own gun and shoot Kawara, before explaining that Sayama is specifically the child of Kawara and the boss's wife, Suyun Jung. Kawara tells him to shut his mouth before getting gunned down, Tamiya running in to try and help him, Kurahashi then proclaiming one thing has been keeping him going the last 26 years being able to take his revenge today, knowing Kawara slaughtered the Jingwon who came over from Korea, planning to put a bullet in him for every member he murdered, Sayama then stepping in to protect him. Kurahashi questions if she would break the creed, her rebutting the creed has nothing to do with her, him then deciding to kill her along with Kawara, Kiryu then running in to take down Kurahashi, with Sayama shooting to disarm the rat. Kiryu proclaims that this town has had enough of the Jingguan, saying since Kazama can't do it, they get to deal with him, proceeding to fight Kurahashi and his own group of Jingguan members. After beating them, he goes to untie Date, Kurahashi trying to reach the bomb's controller before Sayama steps in, threatening to shoot if he moves. Kurahashi then reaching for his gun to kill her, only for Kawara to jump in the way of the bullet. Then running out of bullets, with Kawara grabbing Sayama's gun to kill him. Everyone then runs over to Kawara whilst he's fading, Sayama thanking him for saving her, him being glad that at least once in his life he got to act like a father, explaining the reason he never told Sayama the truth was because because he wanted to respect her mother's wishes. We then flush back to when the two met the night of the raid. We learn that after the scene from the intro of him convincing her to escape rather than kill herself, he and Besho sucked Suyon into Kansai, knowing she'd be in danger in Kamurocho. He then checked in on her after six months, seeing the night had cut a hole through her heart as she was falling apart at the seams, with her also having to give up her child through tears. Kawara knew that given her current 
current shape, she wouldn't survive, so he tried to build a new life for her, with the two eventually living together, and Sayama being born not too long after. You know, for a guy who just keeps murdering people as a police officer, that's kind of a sweet thing that he did. Kawara having planned to turn down an opportunity to work in Hong Kong to be with them. However, Suyong convinced him it'd be fine, as it was just for one year. But while he was gone, she was murdered by Jingwon members from the mainland, which is what led to Kawara's path of killing every Jingwon member in Japan, these having been the illegal immigrants he killed that led to his nickname of Killer Kawara, having done so as both revenge for Suyon and to erase Sayama's past. Tamiyo explaining that before Suyon died, she came to her, wanting Sayama to be free from her cursed past, by giving her to someone with no connections to the Jingwon, with Kawara also having to keep a distance from her, revealing that one of Kawara's calls to Tamiyo was the conversation Sayama overheard to learn about the Tojo's involvement with her parents, which is what dragged her back in. Oh. Sayama says she's happier knowing the truth, as there's nothing scarier than not knowing. Kawara apologises for what he put her through, with him also staying it's not his place to say when asked what happened to Suyon's other child. He tells Sayama the blood in her veins isn't Jing Wan, saying it's kind, hardworking, and strong, like Suyon. Her saying it's also like him, that it's his blood too. Kawara then saying that holding Sayama's hands reminds him of when she was a baby, asking her for him and her mother that she find her happiness, thanking Sayama before dying. How do you feel about the reveal of Kawara being Sayama's father? I really didn't see it coming. Um, at first, I was quite annoyed because I thought Kawara was just this insane police officer who went around murdering people. But then, after the reveal that like he kills the Jingwan members like as a result of revenge, I thought it made him a lot more sympathetic in that way. I guess the only other big thing is then, how do you feel about the reveal of Kurahashi having been a Jingwon survivor? That... I wasn't expecting that at all. It felt like it came a bit out of nowhere, but in a good way. I mean, I kind of expected someone to be revealed as one of the survivors. I just, like, had no idea as to who. Chapter 14, The go Ryu March. Kiryu and the Floris are walking together in Kamurocho Hill's construction site, him and his men having moved back to Purgatory after last night. Date then handing Sayama Kawara's ashes, saying he was a good cop to the end. Sayama states she's happy to know he was her dad, even if it wasn't for long. Tamiya saying they'll put him to rest next to Suyon, with Sayama then apologising for putting her through so much. Tamiya saying there's no need, as it's all part of being her mother. Aww. That's nice. Date approaches Kiri and the florist, saying he's curious about what happened to Suyon's previous child that she had to give up. Kiri believing that if the Jingwon somehow got to them, they could be involved in everything that's gone down. The florist also pointing out that the rat managed to escape, meaning their problems with the Jingwon are far from over. Date then reveals a disc he saw from Kurahashi, suggesting it could have vital information on it, suggesting Sayama could be able to crack it given her tech background. We then cut over to Ryuji, a family member in his car confirming over the phone that the Go Ryu clan have just left Osaka for their planned invasion that night, before telling the boss that five trucks worth of weapons have arrived in Kamurocho. Ryuji says that invading Kamurocho has been on the Omi's to-do list for ages, 
with even his own father not being able to do it. With this being the event which will lead him to taking down every other Yakuza clan in the country, at which point he will finally be the one true dragon, saying his dad better be watching as he's about to do the one thing he couldn't. This, this very much feels like those anime memes where it's like, the character going, I am the Yakuza. Ryuji is the Yakuza too. Perspective then shifts to Takashima, who says over the phone that everything is going to plan. The person on the other end telling him not to celebrate yet. Him retorting they have no business in patronizing him staying ill head up when the time is right before hanging up. A Takashima family member enters, informing him about the Goryu clan's current mobilization to Kamurocho, Takashima saying there's no reason to worry as they have plenty of time, before reminding him of their ace in the hole. Back over to Kiryu and the gang, Sayama is struggling with the disc as she can't brute force the password, Staying she needs a special application which isn't on the laptop they had on hand. Date then suggesting she might be able to crack it using the system at the police HQ's high tech crime unit. However, the Tokyo PD isn't on their side right now and Date is technically still a wanted criminal. The florist then suggesting she use Osaka's system, her then agreeing since she was planning to head back anyway with Tamiyo. Kiryu picks up there's something off with Sayama and decides to talk with her, the two meeting in Serena. There's a bit of an awkward silence between the two before Kiryu asks if she's going back to Kansai. Sayama saying she can't leave Tamiyo by herself after all that happened, Kiryu agreeing it's a good idea. She then then says she feels like she's running away at the climax, Kiryu saying she doesn't have to worry about them, her saying Kiryu doesn't need to be in a protective custody anymore. Sayama then admits she's scared of finding out anything else about what's happening, claiming she's never felt this way before, that she was so eager to find the truth she just assumed she could handle it, saying Kiryu was right that all the truth did was her. Sayama goes to leave but is then stopped by Kiryu, who then gets up, tell her she'll be fine, and then goes in for a kiss. Let's go! Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Finally! <laughs> With him then telling her that whatever she finds, he'll never think less of her, asking that she promise him that no matter what she finds, she'll come back, her promising before taking her leave. I don't trust it, I really don't. Something terrible is gonna happen and I'm just waiting for it. After she leaves, Kiryu then gets a phone call from Date, who just got word from Dr. Rimoto that Kazuki is finally awake. <laughs> but apparently, he's been saying some strange things. Specifically, he's been talking about bombs, with Kiryu and Date deciding to head over to figure out what the hell he's going on about. When Kiryu gets there, Date, as well as Yuya, are already present with Date apologizing for getting him roped into things, Kazuki saying it's fine as he's the one who saved him, revealing he had been locked up by the Jingwon for the last six months, explaining that they jumped him outside Stardust one night, made him a hostage, and replaced him with a body double from within their ranks. Kazuki then tells them that whilst he was captured, he overheard some of their conversations, saying he didn't get everything, but they're planning to destroy the city, revealing that there's more than one bomb and that the whole town is rigged to explode. Oh my God. He doesn't know where the bombs are, but he knows how many there are after hearing a member say they made one bomb for every brother they lost 26 years ago, meaning they made 33 bombs with 31 still being armed to go off. Jesus Christ. Date says he's going to call in the bomb squad as even if they do find the bombs, they still need a technician to disarm them safely. Kiryu then tells Date he's going to Tojo HQ as they're going to need all the help they can get due to the bombs and the incoming threat of the Goryu clan. Date taking over of bomb duties. Kiryu tells Yaoyoi, Daigo and Kasha 
Kusawagi about the current situation, telling them Date has gone to the police to take care of the bombs, and they need to deal with the Goryu clan in order to protect the city. Yaoyoi stating that because most of their officers are down, they have a lot of men with no one to form the ranks. Daigo then asks Kashiwagi how many men he could get together, him saying he could maybe manage 300 that are local to Kamurocho. Daigo then asking if he'll trust him with those 300 men. With Kashiwagi hanging out to make calls, Daigo now being ready to take the stand to protect Kamurocho, as his father and Kazama did everything they could to protect the city, and he's not about to hand it over to Ryuji. We see Daigo rallying up the troops, saying this is a fight for every Yakuza in Kanto, him wanting to give back to the city he loves and show these Goryu assholes they aren't welcome in Kamurocho. Kiri then stating no one would object to Daigo taking over after this. Nice. Oh, nice. Kiri then gets a call from Date asking him to come to Purgatory, saying they've got trouble with Daigo tagging along. Once they get over there, Date says that HQ doesn't want to get involved, the florist explaining that they likely didn't believe him due to him still being a murder suspect, along with the only evidence being Kazuki's word, the police not wanting to act without more solid proof. Yeah. Well, that's helpful. Kiri then says they'll have to find the bombs themselves, telling Daigo to get his men to work on disarming the bombs, stating he'll take on the Goryu clan alone. That sounds about right. Explaining Kamurocho's a big place, so it'll be hard to find the bombs, but if anyone knows the city, it's the Tojo. Date then says it'd be easier if they knew where to start, the florist claiming it'd be a cinch if his systems were still operating here. Majima then enters the scene, joking about how they seem to be fucked. Him then demanding everyone get out of his way before slamming his head onto the florist's desk. What? Did you say his head? Everyone is confused as Majima continues to keep bashing his brains into the desk until he finally hits the right spot, sending the desk downward, revealing he kept the original system intact just in case. The florist immediately getting to work to find the bombs, with Kiryu leaving it to Daigo before heading out to face the Goryu clan. After leaving the florist's office, he gets a call from the Bantam Barkeep, finding out the Goryu clan's invasion has started and they're on the hunt for Kiryu. On the way there, also getting calls from Dokimoto and Yuya, with them fighting off the Goryu clan across the city, the last fight taking place in Stardust, Kiryu arriving after the group already beat up Yuya, with Ryuji being present in the club, saying he did this invasion and targeted Kiryu's friends as it's no fun if he doesn't take it seriously. After Kiryu beats the last of the Goryu, he's left exhausted, Ryuji then brandishing his sword before heading down. However, he stops right before slashing Kiryu, stating if he takes Kiryu out like this, he won't become the real dragon, adding that Kiryu has some unfinished business with the bombs, claiming that was done independently by the Jingwon, him having nothing to gain from Kamurocho burning down, saying he plans to take over Kamurocho, him wanting it to look pretty instead of a pile of ash. He tells Kiryu that once he's done to come to him, claiming he's not going to run or hide, and that he'll be waiting at the highest point in Kamurocho, no distractions, just him and Kiryu, with Kiryu agreeing whilst Ryuji leaves. The fact that Majima walked in and then just <laughs> bashes his face on the I like death. how Majima is just stealing every all our attention. <laughs> to be fair, he's acting so... Like, even by Yakuza standards, he's acting so ridiculously, you can't help but look. I mentioned it earlier, but this is basically... I think in this game they wanted to soften Majima a bit, so he's basically gone from menacing guy with funny bits to just straight up comedy relief. <laughs> I think that was a good choice because, like, 
I don't know about you guys, but I couldn't take him too seriously in the first game. And the fact that they've, like, honed in on his ridiculousness, I think, is just incredible. Yeah, I think you can pretty much tell this was the game where Majma, I think, started to overtake Kiri was the most popular character in the series. Anything else about Chapter 14? Do you at least have anything to say about Daigo kind of finishing his character up by becoming the Tojo sixth chairman? I think that was pretty cool. Also, I, I do very much appreciate the kiss. Oh yeah, Kiryu and Sayama being an official thing now. That that cool. emotional payoff was so, so sweet. Chapter 15, Blood and Bonds. Kiryu helps clean up Stardust and sees to Yuya after the Goryu incident. Kiryu commending him for being able to stand his own against them. Yuya explaining that him and Kazuki owe their current success to the town, so he can't stand it when someone else tries to muscle their way in, before lamenting there wasn't a thing he could do to stop them. Kiryu saying that isn't true, as he risked his life to protect the club, him adding that since Yuya and the other members of Stardust are able to work every night to keep Kamurocho alive, he views them as being better than he is, since Kiryu believes he's only only helpful during crisis events like this. Uh, he doesn't give himself enough credit. Oh yeah, I'm only good during an invasion, as if like, that isn't like maximum insanity. Daigo then enters the club, Kiryu telling him about the current arrangement with Ryuji. Daigo then informing him they've taken care of all but one of the bombs, the last one being handled by Majima. Oh you've- oh. <laughs> oh no. We then shift over to the Mad Dog, who's telling one of his employees, named Nishida, which wires to cut. He asks Nishida why he's being so slow, him saying he's worried about dying due to his mother living alone in the country, Majima saying that's why they're stopping it. Nishida then asking why he keeps tapping his forehead, Majima revealing he has no idea how the bomb works and is purely going off of instinct. <laughs> Him then asking Nishida if he's doubting his instincts, with Nishida immediately getting back to the job at hand, before pointing out they're down to the last two wires. Majima getting fed up with the situation, decides to pick which wire to cut via eeny meeny miny mo. You're joking, right? No, that's real. My brain just died upon hearing that. Nishida asking if he can take the life or death situation more seriously, only for Majima to take the wire codes to do the job himself. The bomb then explodes, only to cut so Sayama revealing the explosion was a dream fake out. She's managed to crack the disc, however, the only information we can see is a document on Ryuji, Sayama being shocked by what she's found. Back to Kiryu, who's still in disbelief that they put Majima on bomb defusal duty. He decides to head over to Purgatory with Daigo. Over at the construction site, Kiryu thanks Majima for taking care of the bomb, him saying it's fine, claiming it wasn't hard and that he partially did it for shits and giggles. I don't believe that. He then heads out to eat, saying the rest is up to Kiryu, with him also threatening that he'll ruin Kiryu if he loses to Ryuji, claiming he still wants another showdown. Sounds about right. He'd probably already be dead if he lost. Kiryu then talks with Date, saying that after Sayama comes back, he's taking on Ryuji tonight, but in the meantime is going to spend some more free time with Haruka, also agreeing to meet with Date at Serena later. After getting the call from Date saying he's ready to meet, and wrapping up anything he wants to do with Haruka, Kiryu heads over, where they have a surprise guest with Sudo, with Date asking if Haruka can temporarily leave the room whilst they talk. He reveals printouts of the information they got from a copy of Kurahashi's disc, which he had Sudo look over, them turning out to be profiles of Ryuji and Sayama, with him telling Kiryu to look at who's listed under Ryuji's parents, it turning out to be Suyon Jun, meaning that not only is Ryuji the son of the Jingwon boss, but he's Sayama's half-brother. What? I see. Sayama then enters, asking why everyone looks so gloom. 
Kyria claiming everything's fine, with Date introducing her to Sudo, who afterwards then takes his leave with the documents, with Date lying by claiming that he was here to talk about the bombs, Sayama in return then lying that the HQ couldn't crack the disc. Kiri then tells her about the current plan with Ryuji, with Date adding that his statement of weighing for Kiri at the highest point in Kamurocho is likely referring to the Kamurocho Hills construction site. Sayama then claims she's forbidding Kiryu from going since, as a detective, she can't turn a blind eye to someone planning to enter a death match. And when she threatens to arrest him, he just tells her to do it as he's not giving up on the showdown with Ryuji. Sayama then telling him that before he goes, Besho is down at Tokyo PD and wants to tell Kiryu something, reckoning it might have to do with the odd behaviour of the Takashima family, with him waiting for Kiryu in archive room 13. Date deciding to tag along. Over at Tokyo PD, Kerio and Date comment that Sayama was acting strangely, suggesting she might have found something in Kansai, adding that it's strange Osaka's chief of organized crime invited them to Tokyo's scandal graveyard. Once in the room, they find nothing's in there except a laptop which has a video from Sayama, starting with her apologizing for the wild goose chase and stating the video was made in the event something happens to her. She confesses that she actually did manage to crack Kurahashi's disc, in turn finding out the hidden relation between her and Ryuji, adding that he's now her only living blood relative. Finding it ironic that she grew up hating organized crime, only to find out she's the half-sibling of a Yakuza. She now wants to talk with him in an attempt to end his warpath, as both a half-relative and a cop, adding she'll never forget the time she spent with Kiryu in Osaka, stating it will be her only memory with him, but she's fine with it believing their worlds are too different to be together, and that she shouldn't let Kiryu in like she did, going to show how special he is, apologizing she couldn't end the goodbye with a smile, but that she's keeping the promise to stop running from her fate before ending the video. I fucking knew that something was going to happen, that the other penny was going to drop and it wouldn't last, I knew it. <laughs> Like, I, I knew that the thing with Sayama and Kiryu wasn't going to last, but like, I this is the first time I'm annoyed that I was right. How do you feel about the reveal Ryuji is the boss's son who survived that night? Personally, it felt a little bit out of nowhere for me, but it's still kind of cool. I, I do like how it's like almost everyone here, or at least all the major characters, they're all connected to what happened on the night of the massacre in one way or another. We're also just all related to each other, it seems, as well. Chapter 16, Decision. I wonder there's going to be a decision. I haven't had that one in a while. Kiryu and Date meet back at Serena. They know Sayama has gone after Ryuji and Kiryu is still adamant about going, as the war ends the moment he's taken care of. Date reminding Kiryu to be careful, since that also means he's not going to be holding back anymore. Once Kiryu's ready, he heads outside to be met with swarms of Jingwan members, having to fight them off the entire way to and inside Kamurocho Hills, one even fighting him on the elevator up to Ryuji. <laughs> Once he gets to the roof, he sees Sayama and Ryuji. Ryuji wanting to know what's going on, while Sayama is threatening to shoot him if he doesn't hand over Jin Goda. Him revealing Jin's on the roof with them, Kiryu running over to untie the man and telling Sayama he's fine. Ryuji then asks what she's doing here, her stating she's here to arrest him. Ryuji joking she's a bit late to that, and points out her affiliation with the Tojo, meaning she's hardly a flawless cop. With her adding, she'll be sending herself in as well, and that she'll be joining Ryuji wherever he goes, 
her then spilling the beans on the two being half-siblings, stating she doesn't want to see any more of her family die, asking him to stop as both a cop and his sister. The probably usually is like, first thing he says is like, well, you're not good either. Ryuji is left pretty bewildered at the news he has a sibling, with Jin Goda then corroborating her story, saying he's sorry he couldn't tell him. With him revealing he took in both Ryuji and Suyon after he happened to run into her at a bar and listening to her story. Then when Kawara transferred to Osaka to look for her, he took her from Jin, though he's not resentful of it as, at the end of the day, he's still Yakuza, knowing Suyon only agreed to stay with him to survive. Ryuji then asks if that means his mother threw him away. Jin then stating it was at his request Ryuji stayed, having begged Suyon to let him keep Ryuji as he viewed him as his real son. Strange, I think. Is it strange? Hey, a bit. Just a bit. Before he can continue, Ryuji shouts at him to shut up, asking why he should care now, claiming that he's been alone his entire life, his only goal being to surpass his father, pointing out that he went as far as working with the Jingwan to make the war even happen, confirming he does still remember what happened that night, though he claims that's irrelevant and he doesn't care about their grudge with the Tojo, they just happen to share a similar goal. That feels kind of shallow of Ryuji, but then again, it's Ryuji. Despite Sayama's urges to stay back, Kiryu heads towards Ryuji, telling him he's exactly the kind of person Kiryu thought he was, saying he can't change the way he lives, that he's driven by his instincts and acts upon them. Ryuji claims he doesn't know him, Kiryu then stating, he reminds him of an old friend, one who chose to fight to give meaning to his life, and that a man like that deserves everything he's got. Kiryu then brings up the shutters on the elevator to prevent Sayama from interfering before apologizing to her, with him and Ryuji then getting ready for their final battle. Kiryu is ultimately victorious, with Ryuji struggling to stand afterwards. Kiryu apologizes to Jin, though he tells him it's better this way, as thanks to Kiryu, he finally got to hear how Ryuji truly feels. Going on to say he hid the only things that truly mattered to Ryuji, feeling he would leave him if he learned the truth. He then tells Sayama that as Ryuji's father, it's his responsibility to pay for Ryuji's crimes, saying he's carried the Omi this far and wants things to end now, requesting he be taken in alongside Ryuji. Suddenly, they hear a familiar voice congratulate them for how faithfully they followed his script. The person turning out to be Yukio Tarada, who in addition to still being alive, reveals himself as Daijin Kim, the final survivor of the Jingwan Massacre. God damn it. Him explaining that he faked his death as it was the only way to make sure Kiri would take the bait, with him getting Kiri involved in order to make the Omi respond and set the stage for a Kanto Kansai war, with the plea to get a truce between the Tojo and Omi being his way of putting Ryu 
Yujian to play, as he would naturally oppose the truce, leading to his invasion and ultimate defeat at the hands of Kiryu, Ryuji having become a target due to him turning his back on the creed by refusing to rejoin the Jingguan. He then states that once they kill Kiryu, the Tojo crumbles and it will all be over bringing in a group of Jingguan men. Before taking a smoke and reflecting on the 26 years he lived as Yukio Tarada, staying that too will soon be over as once Kiri is dead, he'll end things with the switch for the explosives, revealing there had been one more bomb hidden in Kamurocho Hills, explaining this one is for Korahashi after he was killed by Kawara, stating it will drown Kamurocho in a sea of flames, telling the three that by the time it goes off, they won't be around to care. Kiri then asks if what Daijin said in front of Kazama's grave was also a lie, revealing that Kazama was the one who saved Daijin from the massacre, with us seeing a flashback to a young Daijin and Youngmin who narrowly avoid getting spotted by Shimano, only to be found by Kazama when they try to attack from behind, who told the two to live that they're both still young and to not waste their lives, Kiryu having watched the whole thing from just outside the room. Daijin said it's true, that the reason he and Yonmin survived that night was because of Kazama, explaining that he struck at Kazama over and over to try and avenge his brothers, yet he still looked after him to the point of leading Daijin to the Omi, Jin adding that after he joined, Kazama had actually met with Jin to watch over him. Kiri then asks if Daijin has a shred of humanity after all Kazama did for him, Daijin replying that Kiryu doesn't get it, that for the Jingguan, the creed always comes first, even if it means killing their own parents, that's their fate. What the fuck? Kiryu claims those aren't the words of a human, Daijin stating their organization abandoned humanity, as how else could they survive 26 years for the sole purpose of revenge? That's the most metal thing I've ever heard in my entire life. He then says Kiryu is just an obstacle now, sending in his men to kill him. Kiryu manages to defeat the Jingwon men, Daijin claiming this isn't over before starting to collapse, Kiryu then stating this is where his script ends. He heads over to Sayama and Jin, only to suddenly get shot in the back, immediately collapsing. The shooter being revealed to be Takashima, who then thanks Kiryu for clearing people out of his way one after another, with Kiryu demanding Sayama stay back when she tries to help. Takashima tells Daijin he's done well and to leave the rest to him, Jin asking if he's the one behind everything before getting shot, with Sayama then pulling out a gun only to have it shot out of her hand. Takashima then reveals that Daijin's script was based on his vision, him having worked with the Jingwon due to their shared goal of wanting to destroy the Tojo. He then states their goals are all but accomplished, meaning Daijin is no longer necessary shooting him in the chest at point-blank range, a device then falling out of Daijin's pocket. Takashima jokes that Daijin never saw the betrayal coming, him then shooting Jin Goda again, telling him before he dies that he plans to become the Omi Alliance's sixth chairman and absorb the Tojo clan, making him the de facto ruler of the Yakuza, with him then using the Jing Wan to spread into the mainland, Jin then dying as a result of his wounds. Oh man, this... I was hoping the Jin Goda wouldn't die. 
really just proves that no one's allowed to be on Kiryu's side. He then mocks the group, asking why they trust people, Daijin revealing he never did, knowing in his heart something was off about Takashima, declaring that his plan won't end how he thinks it will, Daijin then taking two more shots before making a last request of Kiryu, asking him to stop Takashima before setting off the bomb's countdown, begging Kiryu to trust him before he too succumbs to his wounds and dies. The bomb begins its 10 minute countdown, Takashima shooting Daijin's corpse out of frustration, Sayama then attempting to attack him with a baton only to get grappled, Kiryu jumps for Sayama's gun but Takashima threatens to kill Sayama if Kiryu moves an inch, and despite Sayama's pleas to shoot him, Kiryu can't do it, Takashima proclaiming Kiryu can't bear to make sacrifices before shooting Kiryu in the shoulder. He then puts the gun behind Sayama's head, saying it's her turn to die, at which point Ryuji starts to get up, grabbing a gun and just constantly blasting holes into Takashima, with the couple shots he manages to land on Ryuji doing nothing to stop him. Takashima laments that he let himself get beaten by an idiot like Ryuji, Ryuji retorting that a real man ought to be a little stupid, and that a scheming fuck like Takashima could never stand on top, before shooting Takashima through the brain. Man. He, Ryuji's doing good now. He then turns to Kiryu, who manages to get up and heads towards Ryuji, who's still adamant that there can only be one dragon. Kiryu agreeing with him. Sayama shouts at the two that they need to get out as the bomb goes off in five minutes. Ryuji saying he's beginning to fade and that he has to settle things. And despite Sayama's cries that they need to get out, Kiryu says he's staying before trapping Sayama in the elevator so she can escape telling her to live her life, as he still has business to take care of. Ryuji saying that based on how Kiri is acting now, he can see how his sister fell for him, agreeing that she needs to get out. Sayama saying she can't watch any more family or the man she loves die. Ryuji tells her that both he and Kiryu are falling apart, stating that even if they do get out, they'll likely die anyway. That letting him stay to fight Kiryu is a once in a lifetime request, asking if Sayama can do her brother this one favor before sending her down the elevator the two dragons then proceeding to have their final clash. Kiryu ultimately proves the victor, though they're both struggling to stand. Sayama then entering via the stairs, holding Ryuji in her arms. He says that she reminds him of their mother, asking if she remembers her at all, feeling sorry that she lost her before she was old enough to remember. Sayama asks what she was like, Ryuji saying she looks a lot like her, adding the first time he saw Sayama, he thought of her. When Sayama starts crying, he laments that he didn't know about her until now. Sayama saying they might have managed to avoid all this if they'd known, 
Ryuji saying he's got too much Jingwon blood in him, so death would have found him one way or another. Feeling that he made it further than he thought he would, he asked if Sayama could smile for him. Saying their mother's face whenever she laughed was great, Sayama doing so, with Ryuji appreciating her showing her smile before finally dying. I was hoping that Ryuji would survive, but uh, it's a Yakuza game. Yeah. The bomb is still ticking, with a helicopter arriving. Date, Sudo, and Haruka being inside, them urging Kiryu to get out. However, he begins to collapse due to his wounds, and when Sayama comes over to try and help him, he tells her to run as he can barely move. And despite saying she'll carry Kiryu if she has to, he tells her to save herself. After Sayama realizes how truly bad Kiryu's situation is, she decides to stay with him, refusing to leave despite his pleas. The two then embrace each other, with the helicopter having to leave as it's too dangerous to get any closer. The timer then goes past one minute, the two lamenting that they let down Haruka, but feeling she'd understand their choice. The two then hugging, Kiryu asks if she's scared. Sayama replies she is, but she's never felt warmer, with everyone watching on as the countdown approaches zero. After the credits, we see Haruka praying at the graveyard, revealing that Daijin, under his alias Tarada, has been put to rest alongside Kazama, Yumi, and Nishiki. Kiryu talks with Date about how the bomb was fake, that he wasn't lying when he said he never trusted Takashima, revealing the device that fell out of his pocket was the bomb's fuse meaning he never intended for it to go off. Kiryu then says that he didn't know the bomb was fake, with him believing that Daijin's last plea to trust him was in reference to how he felt towards Kazama. Sayama then arrives with some flowers, Date leaving to give them room to talk, the game ending with Kiryu and Haruka speaking with Sayama. So I guess just first thoughts on the final chapter. I think the the final um, the final chapter was re done really really well. The, it was a very like emotional chapter, especially with like Sayama and Kiryu like choosing to stay with each other. Ryuji was also built up to be a more likable character before the final battle, so you didn't really have a good idea of who you were rooting for. I this was a really good final chapter. Within the fan base, Yakuza 2 is often considered to have one of the best stories in the series. So I guess first, how do you feel about Yakuza 2's story on its own? And then how does it compare to Yakuza 1? I think Yakuza 2 had a it did have a slow start, but then once the once the plot started moving, it didn't stop moving, and I really enjoyed that. I also love how there was a romantic interest for Kiryu that actually felt realistic, in a sense. The cast of characters also felt more diverse, and the returning cast, particularly Majima, they were portrayed in quite fun ways. I do feel like um, Yakuza 1 was more like setting it up and like experimenting with like different characters and how they're going to portray them and the story and stuff like that. And then Yakuza 2 was more like, okay, we've got this, so let's just go balls to the wall insane. I think he definitely did the um, over the top a lot better than the second one. I feel like narratively, obviously like the first one does the, the job of explaining it better, but the second one was definitely more fun for people who have played the first one. I feel like it's definitely more fun than that. They did a really good job in like expanding the world by both properly delving into the Omi Alliance, who are only like vaguely mentioned in the first game, 
as well as like the new threat of the Jingwan Mafia. I like how they're able to wrap all these various characters and connect them, or at least most of them, to like this one tragic event that happened. And it's, I think it was kind of smart how they eventually bring everyone in to the destination. And also I just overall think Ryuji is, was just a much better villain than Nishiki. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Nishiki was basically just like a two-dimensional villain that the game wanted you to care about because he was friends with Kiryu off-screen. Ryuji, they actually like take their time to build him up, basically explain why you should give a shit about him, and then play with you a bit by showing you how maybe he's more than what he initially let on, and that he actually has his own like beliefs and morals, that even if they're messed up, he still has some sort of driving force behind him and he's not just a two-dimensional bad guy who just wants to kill Kiryu for no reason. The thing I don't like is when series just like kill off villains that like, really cut throat and it's like you could bring- you don't have to kill off every villain. But I didn't like how they killed off Ryuji. That's a thing with Yakuza, they have a really bad problem where they'll often either kill off characters and some of the characters who do survive, they just don't show up again in the next entry. We obviously won't be covering them all in one go, but after this you have the PS3 trilogy with Yakuza 3, 4, and 5. And for various reasons, all three of those games are rather mixed reception in terms of their narrative. Like, some people like them and other people don't like them for various reasons. Like, we'll get more into it when we get to those specific games, but we've basically gone from weakest narrative to one of the strongest narrative, to assuming we do another one, three in a row, which have a mixed reception. So it'll be interesting to see how we all land on whether or not those games' stories are good or not. I guess if there's nothing else to say, 15 likes and we'll do Yakuza 3. Also, maybe leave suggestions if you want to see a video like this that isn't Yakuza. Thank you very much for watching our insanity. And also, you smell beautiful.